like to talk about the United Kingdom and how they have the best system. Dear colleagues, we uh, will continue our work 
Uh, the first item of business this afternoon is a current affairs debate on, and I quote the title, United Kingdom Agreement on Asylum Seekers and the Critical Government Reaction Regarding the European Court of Human Rights Decision. The debate will last one hour, as is written down in our rules, and speaking time is limited to three minutes for all members except for the first speaker chosen by the Bureau who is allowed seven minutes. The debate, therefore, will end by 4.30, when we have the second current affairs debate of the day, under the title, Consequences of the Blockade on the Black Sea. If that is clear, now I call in the debate first Mr. Frank Schwabe, and Frank, you have seven minutes to introduce the debate. Mr. President, uh, dear colleagues, first I would like to thank you that you appoint me unanimously as uh, the first speaker in this debate. I thank you for this trust and for the support um, to do this. So this discussion is in general not about the question of migration as a right or the right of asylum seekers. Although we have to understand that there is a big challenge, for sure there is a big challenge, because on the one hand we ask for support for support and to respect the Geneva Convention. On the one hand, on the other hand, we have to face a reality that more and more countries do not really care about this Geneva Convention. But whatever is the answer to the challenges, and we have to discuss it here in the next weeks, months, and years, Rwanda for sure cannot be a partner for any kind of migration or asylum agreement. And I would like to quote Amnesty International report 2021 about Rwanda. Violations of the rights to a fair trial, freedom of expression and privacy continued, alongside enforced disappearances, allegations of torture and excessive use of force. This is a description about the real situation in Rwanda, how anybody can have the idea to whatever bring people to this country. However, and whatever, you think about the question of migration and asylum. It is 100% necessary to respect the judgments of the Court of Human Rights. And I will say it again, it is 100% necessary to respect the judgments of the Court of Human Rights. The EHCHR, again and again, is the core and the heart of this organization. And it is a red line for all member countries. It's a red line, it was a red line for Russia, it's a red line for Turkey, it is for Azerbaijan and all other countries. And it's as well the red line for the government of the United Kingdom. They are obliged to implement the judgment of the ECHR courts as well and not to pick which one they like and which one they don't like. And as there was not just an attack, an oral attack on the court from a respective and responsible member of the UK government, but the presentation of the new, a new law preventing the obligation of fulfilling the judgment of the European Court on Human Rights as well. It is a matter, matter of great concerns for us. Come on, colleagues. We are in the stage of preparing the fourth summit. Historical, a historical situation for this organization with the aim of strengthening, or I understand it may be wrong, with the aim of strengthening the Council of Europe the European Court of Human Rights. How can one country start to weaken the convention and the court in such a way just in this week? And how the distinguished government of the United Kingdom wants to argue in the case of Russia and Turkey, in which case we do everything that the Turkish government respect the judgment of the court to do everything to release Osman Kavala and Selita Atin Demetash from prison in these days. But it's not just a debate, and I think we should prevent to think of it. It's not just a debate here in Strasbourg in the Council of Europe. It's a, a debate in the United Kingdom as well. And because of this, I would like to quote. First, Sasha Deshmukh, Amnesty International's UK chief ex executive, who said, the court's intervention in the Rwanda deportation last week was an example of it enacting its fundamental role in ensuring basic human rights aren't violated, stating nothing more than that the UK should pause removals to Rwanda pending the outcome 
of our own domestic judicial review process. And it's very troubling that the UK government is prepared to damage respect for the authority of the European Court of Human Rights because of a single decision that it doesn't like. And Stephanie Boyce, who is the president of the Law Society of uh, England and Wales, said, the erosion of accountability trumpeted by the Justice Secretary signals a deepening of the government's disregard for the checks and balances that underpin the rule of law. The bill will create an acceptable class of human rights abuses in the United Kingdom by introducing a bar on claims deemed not to cause significant disadvantage. And she proceeds, it is a large, large backwards for British justice. Authorities may begin to consider some rights violations as acceptable because this could no, no longer be challenged under the Bill of Rights despite being against the law. Overall, the bill would grant the state a greater unfettered power over the people, power which would then belong to all future governments, whatever their ideologi uh, ideologies. I finish with, 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 uh, uh, with a quote. So it's really, really, really a big matter um, of concerns. And I would like to ask a distinguished colleague, really distinguished colleague, John Howell, who will speak later, and who is the chair of the delegation of, from the United Kingdom here. We had a discussion some days ago where you said that uh, when Priti uh, Patel, the UK Home Secretary, attacked the court, it was just a private position. And I would like to quote her from the media in, in UK. Um, she said, what is politically motivated? Was it politically motivated? I'm in the view that it is absolutely. The opaque way this court has operated is absolutely scandalous. And she proceeds, she wants to find ways to overturn um, this um, decision. And my question really is, to the distinguished colleagues from the United Kingdom, will you support at the end this law in the United Kingdom, what at the end undermine this organization. Dear colleagues, this parliamentary assembly has to defend the values of this organization, the convention, and the court. And we have to ask the UK government, along this way, if you go this way, you are a part of questioning and ultimately destroying this organization and its values. It's better leave it alone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Frank, Frank, for uh, the inter introducing this debate. Dear colleagues, before I open the debate, we have in total 17 people who asked for the floor. I can accommodate you all if everybody sticks to three minutes or less. So please act in solidarity. Do not wait until you hear the bell. And if you hear the bell, stop your intervention, because then it's up to another colleague who also wants to say something. First in the debate, I call uh, uh, Madam Fiona O'Loughlin from Ireland, and she speaks on behalf of the group, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats in Europe. Fiona, you have Thank the Thank you, Mr. President. Earlier this year, Ireland commemorated 100 years since the establishment of our independent state. The course of our independence was not without difficulty because of the partition of our country, division between North and South, Catholics and Protestants, Unionists and Nationalists. The Good Friday Agreement negotiated by brave men and women in 1998 marked the end of three decades of bloody violence and was and is a blueprint for building a new future on our shared island because it has as its foundation a democratic and inclusive view of our shared island of Ireland. Why is this important in this debate? The European Convention on Human Rights has a very special significance for the Ireland and for the UK because it is an integral part of the Good Friday Agreement, an internationally negotiated agreement that has brought peace in our time. As a country, we owe so many people for what they have done over the past decades to bring people together and build a better future 
and make possible the peace that we enjoy today. Our task today must be to protect that peace, to build new relationships and repair old ones, and ensure that we never go back to the darkest days of the past. We need to work to provide hope and opportunity to a new generation. The fact that the UK government is talking openly about breaching international law is a matter of huge concern. It is deeply disappointing that yesterday the UK has put forward a bill to replace the Human Rights Act and will, if enacted, breach international law as well as severely damaging international relationships and trust. Boris Johnson is certainly giving the impression that nothing is sacred in his view, not the Northern Irish Protocol or Good, Fr a Good Friday Agreement, not the European Convention on Human Rights, nor the European Court of Justice. One person, one Prime Minister, cannot be allowed to rip apart a relationship and respect that took almost a century to build. The European Court, Court of Human Rights has always been a guiding compass. Today, as war rages in Ukraine, key principles of democracy, human rights and the rule of law, and above all, the effective functioning of the European Court of Human Rights, the conscience of Europe and execution of its judgments. A ruling ignored is a human right infringed, and if we are selective in applying the rule of law, before long, lawlessness will be the rule. It is never too late to do the right thing, and we must appeal here for common sense, mutual respect, and adherence to the values, norms, and conventions of both the Council of Europe and the European Convention of Human Rights. There will always be challenges in diplomacy, in interactions with other countries, but the way to resolve these outstanding challenges is through dialogue, partnership, discussion and engagement, rather than unilateral action. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Next in the debate, I call Jos Catrugados from Greece. He speaks on behalf of the United European Left. You have the floor, Jos. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. We owe a lot to the United Kingdom. It is the country which has the longest parliamentary history in the world. In Greece, when there is a vacuum in our written constitution, we refer to the British constitutional history as an indirect source of our constitutional law. United Kingdom is the country in which their legal uh, authors have shaped the concept of the rule of law. So, when we are facing such worrisome, I would say even preposterous cases like the Rwanda case we are discussing, it is not coming from the usual suspect. And this is even more worrisome, exactly because this is not an isolated case. As Fiona has said before me, we have a series of events of unilateral decision of the government of the United Kingdom, not uh, to depart from Europe, to take distances from the continent, but uh, to deviate from standards of the common European legal civilization based on the understanding or the common understanding of the rule of law and the protection of human rights and freedoms. The decision to unilaterally deviate from the North Ireland Protocol is risking to destabilize the situation in the island and create a hard border. Even more dangerous is the decision to revise the Human Rights Act through a new Bill of Rights so as to deviate from the European Convention of Human Rights. These are dangerous decisions that could systematically undermine the legal protection of individuals in the United Kingdom and in uh, Ireland. And uh, we should uh, have, facing these challenges, a common stance. When we have a threat to human rights, standards of the rule of law, we should not ask from where they are coming. And if we are asking, we are expecting much more from the United Kingdom than from other countries in Europe. 
So I think that we should adopt not a double standard policy. The same policy we are, that we are applying towards Russia, that we should apply towards Turkey, not because the United Kingdom has affinities, similarities with these countries, but exactly we, because we must respect our common European legal tradition of human rights and protection of the standards of the rule of law. Thank you, uh, George. Next in the debate, I call Mr. Roberto Rampi from Italy, and he speaks on behalf of the group of the Socialists, Democrats, and Greens. Roberto. Sí, sí, señor presidente. Io credo che noi dobbiamo dirci con grande chiarezza, al di là degli aspetti e dei dettagli, che quello di cui stiamo discutendo oggi è un fatto che può avere delle conseguenze gravissime per la nostra organizzazione, perché il Regno Unito è uno dei paesi fondatori di questa organizzazione e potremmo anche dire il paese fondatore, anzi il paese ispiratore. Fu proprio Winston Churchill il grande promotore di questa organizzazione, che è un'organizzazione che è andata via via crescendo e coinvolgendo tutta l'Europa fino ai suoi estremi confini geografici, andando oltre i confini geografici e arrivando all'Europa dello spirito quella che abita anche magari dall'altra parte del mondo, quando abbiamo gli amici del Messico o gli amici del Canada che intervengono in quest'Aula. E oggi, in un momento in cui per la prima volta noi perdiamo un membro, la seconda, ma fu un periodo molto breve, perdiamo un membro importante come la Russia per i fatti terribili che stanno accadendo in Ucraina, questo Paese fondatore e ispiratore compie degli atti già la Brexit ci aveva preoccupato come europei perché ci faceva pensare che ci fosse un'uscita dall'Europa che non è solo un'uscita tecnica, è un'uscita spirituale, no? è un abbandono, è la scelta di prendere un'altra strada e oggi questi fatti sembrano confermarla, sembrano dire che questo paese guida diventa un paese guida anche di un'idea di superamento di quei valori democratici, dello Stato di diritto, dei diritti umani che sono fondativi. Perché di fronte a una sentenza della Corte dei diritti dell'uomo ci si appella, si combatte, si discute, ma non si prova a trovare una soluzione legislativa per fare a meno di tenerne conto. È proprio la fine del principio che sta alla base di tutto quello che abbiamo costruito. Allora io credo che dal dibattito di quest'Aula, dalle relazioni che abbiamo ascoltato, dalle parole, debba uscire un messaggio fondamentale ai nostri amici, ai nostri colleghi, all'attuale governo del Regno Unito, perché il tema, come per la Russia, come per la Turchia, non è mai i popoli, ma sono i governi del momento. E allora a quel governo noi dobbiamo dire fermatevi, tornate indietro, date un segnale, noi abbiamo bisogno che dalla Gran Bretagna, che dal Regno Unito arrivi un messaggio di unità, di forza, di spirito dei diritti umani e di spirito dello Stato di diritto del rule of law. Grazie. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Now we are going to listen to Mr. Vladimir Vardanian from Armenia, and he speaks on behalf of the European People's Party. Vladimir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do the rule of law possible in the countries the rulings of the courts are challenged? Do human rights protection is possible without the respect towards the rule of law? Do the rule of law may exist without democracy? These components of the legal and democratic engineering are indivisible and inseparable. Judiciary play a crucial role for keeping this trinity. The process of democratic backsliding is not an instant one. It is a very slow process, and you cannot fix when the democracy stops functioning. But it is obvious that the lack of respect to the rulings of the court is one of the clear signals of backsliding. Today, we are discussing the issue which is interconnecting with one of our main institutions, the core of this organization, the European Court of Human Rights. I mentioned for many times in this hemicycle that the ICRC rulings, all ICRC, uh, sorry, ECHR rulings, all ECHR rulings should be respected. Not only the final judgment, but also the interim measures 
and maybe even more, because interim measures are from time to time even more important than final judgment, because if interim measures are not implemented, final judgments would be useless. Ladies and gentlemen, very often states are very reluctant to the implementation of the interim measures, considering them less important than the final judgment. Dear colleagues, we are living in a very alarming time. Then democratic backsliding, degradation of rule of law, and respect towards human rights lead us to more proactive in defending the European Convention and democratic principles we are governed with. States have legitimate right to fight against illegal immigration, but we, first of all, had interna have international commitments to respect their obligations in the field of human rights, especially in the time that European values and principles are so vulnerable. We should be very, very sensitive on this issue, and this discussion should be considered mm -hmm. as the, one of the elements of early prevention of violation of the principles and values of our organization. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vladimir. Now, the last speaker in the, on behalf of political groups is Mr. John Howe from the United Kingdom, and he speaks on behalf of the European Conservatives. John, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I'm extremely grateful to Frank Schwaber for, for this motion. Without his persistent pursuit of it, I doubt very much whether we would have seen a new Bill of Rights introduced into Parliament in the UK this week, uh, which will, of course, increase discussion. So I thank him for that. I doubt, too, whether we would have seen clarification of the government's position. So let me just read out from the document. This is, pro this is produced by the government of the, of the UK and is the final, this final version of what the UK's position is. I just, just read a few quotes. The first one is, we remain a committed party to the ECHR. The rights under the Convention and indeed the Human Rights Act are retained under the Bill of Rights. It goes on to say, the United Kingdom is committed to protecting and respecting human rights, to its membership of the Council of Europe, and to its obligations under the Convention. And thirdly, it says the government is committed to staying in the European Court of Human Rights. And lastly, I just want to read this particular quote from the government's own uh, version of, of, of events, because it's important to what we're, what we're talking about. It says, we recognize our obligation under the Convention to abide by judgments of the court specifically against the United Kingdom. And of course, in the, in the, in the statement yesterday made by the Justice Secretary, he said too that he wanted to, that, that, that we were intending to stay uh, in the ECHR. And why not? I have always been a supporter of the ECHR. I mean, I have nothing to complain about. We have the lowest number of cases per capita uh, in the court. There will be much debate uh, on the, the new Bill of Rights, but it's important to bear in mind what the court has said, uh, uh, that members of the court have said, that there is a difference between domestic law and international law. And this is about domestic law, and there will no doubt be huge amounts of debate in the UK uh, uh, about that. But I want to offer something to PACE today. And that is, I want to offer PACE the opportunity to comment on the domestic bill, the Bill of, the, the, the bill of, of Rights, uh, and they can do that by emailing me, uh, either collectively or through, through one of, the, one of the, co the committees. And I would just issue a final warning for those who, who have got their information from the press. The press are not to, to be trusted, to, to be honest in this, it is my background. They, they make a headline as, uh, uh, out of this rather than, rather than see, seeing, the, the, seeing the facts. Be wary. They, you may have a press that simply rolls over in your own country, but the way of the UK press is coming to you.
Thank you, uh, John. Now we continue the list of speakers. Prochain orateur, uh, Monsieur Pierre Alain Frides uh, de la Suisse. Pierre Alain, la parole est à vous. Merci, Monsieur le Président, Mesdames, Messieurs, chers collègues. Dans le domaine des migrations, on n'arrête pas l'innovation. On avait connu à l'époque l'accord entre la Turquie et l'Union européenne. Depuis toutes ces années, on a connu les pushbacks avec les drames en Méditerranée ou ailleurs. Et là, maintenant, on a certains pays qui proposent de changer la loi nationale permettant la réalisation de pushbacks. Et maintenant, on propose des vacances au Rwanda. On vient d'en parler longuement. Chers collègues, c'est clairement un très mauvais signal que nous donnons au moment où l'Union européenne réfléchit à redéfinir sa politique migratoire. Ça va dans tous les sens. On n'essaie pas d'aller au fond des choses et de régler véritablement euh, la question d'un droit unique, appliqué, respecté dans tous nos États pour que les migrants soient traités correctement selon des règles qui sont claires. Et ces règles, il faut les rappeler. Il n'y a pas de migrants illégaux. Chaque personne peut, si elle en ressent le besoin, demander aide et protection dans un pays. Ce pays doit lui accorder aide et protection et une procédure, une procédure claire, avec des règles, avec la connaissance de ses droits, avec un traducteur. Et ensuite, il y a une décision. Et si cette décision tombe, la personne peut devoir quitter le pays vers un pays tiers sûr. Ça veut dire qu'il y a une nouvelle expertise qui est faite pour savoir si on le renvoie dans un pays en toute sécurité. La deuxième chose qui est un peu choquante dans cette histoire, c'est qu'on a théoriquement une remise en question de, de décision de la Cour européenne. On connaît déjà des précédents avec d'autres pays. Et je vous rappelle quand même que la CEDH, on en est tous persuadés, c'est le fondement de notre institution, c'est l'essence même du Conseil de l'Europe. Et il en va, chers collègues, de nos valeurs, il en va de l'honneur de notre continent. Pour revenir sur l'histoire des migrations, c'est que si maintenant, dans notre continent, le continent qui a vu naître les droits de l'homme, on ne traite pas correctement les migrants, que dire de la façon dont ces migrants pourraient être traités dans d'autres parties du monde C'est vraiment une lutte fondamentale. Nous devons respecter nos règles, nos valeurs. C'est euh, l'expression de la dignité de tout un continent. Merci, Pierre Alain. Next in the debate, I call Mr. Theodoros Osopoulos from Greece. Theodoros, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear colleagues, millions of migrants attempt to reach Europe hoping for a better future for themselves and their loved ones. This has triggered tremendous pressure on frontline countries, and we all know it. For this reason, finding adequate solution to migration pressure in Europe is essential. We must be very careful, though, in bringing the right answers to problems we are facing. Solutions considered must on no account be to the detriment of human rights protection and Council of Europe and European Union countries' observance of their international obligations. Dear colleagues, it is not the first time that this issue is being discussed. I want to remind you that this assembly discussed the possibility to delocalize processing of asylum applications already in 2007, in its resolution 1569 of 2007, and on assessment of transit and processing centers as a response to mixed flows of migrants and asylum seekers, it noted that setting up of transit or processing centers raises a number of practical and legal issues and concerns including in terms of human rights and refugee rights. Observing international human rights obligations is the best way to proceed. Negotiations have taken place and agreements were reached. It is essential that we all ensure in our parliaments to respect of the 1951 Refugee Convention and of the European Convention on Human Rights. We are all aware of the recent decisions of the European Court of Human Rights to halt the removal of a refugee from the United Kingdom to Rwanda. The Committee of Migration, I'm honored to be the chairperson of this committee, agreed on a clear statement last Tuesday regarding this topic. I hope that dialogue will continue on this crucial and controversial issue and the consensus will be eventually found. Dear colleagues, the great comedian Groucho Marx once said, those are my principles, and if you don't like them, well, 
I have others. The Council of Europe must stick to its principles, no matter which member tries to violate them. Thank you. Thank you, Theodore. Next in the debate, I call Madam Serap Yasa from Turkey. You Merci, have Monsieur le Président, chers collègues. Je suis heureuse que l'Assemblée ait immédiatement inscrit à son ordre du jour cette question cruciale du droit d'asile. En avril, les autorités britanniques ont annoncé que les migrants arrivés illégalement seraient relocalisés au Rwanda, affirmant que la relocalisation faciliterait des voies d'asile sûres et légales et que le Rwanda est en mesure d'accueillir des dizaines de milliards de perso personnes. Nous pensons que cette pratique est en contradiction avec le droit d'asile. Il existe de sérieux risques que le principe de non-refoulement soit violé en transférant des forces de demandeurs d'asile au Rwanda. Cette pratique constituerait un mauvais exemple pour d'autres pays. De plus, cette politique s'appuierait sur le fait que le Rwanda est un pays sourd pour les demandeurs d'asile. Cependant, nous ne pouvons pas accepter cette présomption. Hier, la Commission des migrations a adopté un rapport sur les pays tiers sûrs. Le rapport suggère que nous devons surveiller les décisions concernant les pays tiers sûrs afin de protéger les droits des demandeurs d'asile. Mais nous n'avons aucun preuve crédible montrant que le Rwanda est un pays sûr. Dans ce contexte, grâce à les mesures prévisoires immédiates de la Cour de Strasbourg, les demandeurs d'asile ont été préservés d'un risque réel de préjudice irré irréversible. J'espère que la mesure provisoire de la Cour en sauvera également beaucoup d'autres. Nous saurons la mise en œuvre immédiate de la décision. J'espère que cette affaire constituera une étape importante pour la protection du droit d'asile. J'espère que les nouvelles concernant les projets d'adaptation d'une loi qui continuerait les décisions de la Cour ne reflètent pas la réalité. Enfin, le Conseil de l'Europe doit établir de bonnes pratiques pour les autres pays en matière de respect des droits des réfugiés et des demandeurs d'asile. Nous devons arrêter toutes les actions illégales contre les demandeurs d'asile. Merci. Merci à vous, cher Serap. Uh, next in the debate, I call uh, Mr. George Fox from the United Kingdom. George. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, for the very reasons that uh, George and uh, Roberto uh, raised about the respect that so many countries have had for the traditions of the United Kingdom, we in the United Kingdom, all of us, should welcome this debate uh, today. The Bill of Rights, which was introduced yesterday in the United Kingdom Parliament, is a misnomer. It's not a Bill of Rights. It reduces the rights of British citizens. The Justice Minister in the House of Lords, Lord Bellamy, wrote to us all, and he said that this bill will affirm UK Supreme Court uh, independence over Strasbourg rulings. Not the European Court of Human Rights, he doesn't call it that, he calls it Strasbourg Court, almost like a, an insult, uh, the way he uses it. But it will also, uh, as uh, uh, George said earlier, uh, undermine the whole question and sabotage the Northern Ireland Protocol. It also undermines the Scotland Act, which incorporates the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, and I don't think they've uh, really uh, realised that yet. And then John, who, uh, for whom I have the greatest of personal affection, says that he invites you all to comment. But the UK government has actually refused requests from three committee chairs in the House of Commons for pre-legislative scrutiny. Pre-legislative scrutiny we normally have for all constitutional matters. Uh, they're trying to push it through uh, with a majority of 80 in the Commons without proper scrutiny. 
Well, I can tell them they're reckoned without the House of Lords, uh, which is packed full of lawyers who will pull this bill apart. A, a UK bill which weakens uh, UK compliance with European human rights law will give the green light to any authoritarian government in any other member state to go ahead and forget about the principles of the European Court and the Convention uh, on Human Rights. Uh, also, with respect to John as well, the, the government hasn't uh, even ruled out withdrawal from the Convention on Human Rights. Uh, the Prime Minister said all options are on the table. And why are we getting this? Why are we getting this? Oh, there have only been two rulings. One, the voting rights for prisoners, which we implemented, and the one the other day the, on the interim judgment uh, on the flights to Rwanda, which we implemented. Both were implemented. So my feeling is, and the feeling of many of us, is that there, are, there is an ulterior motive for introducing this bill, an ulterior motive of this government that we have currently in the United Kingdom. Frank asked if we support uh, this, uh, his motion and this proposal. As far as the Labour members are concerned, I think I can speak on all of, for all of us. The answer is uh, we reject this bill. We say to the bill, no, no, three times no. Thank you, uh, George. Now in the debate, I, uh, we are going to listen to Madam Ingrid Skow from Norway. Ingrid, you have the floor. Thank you, President. The right to seek asylum is enshrined in the United Nations Refugee, Refugee Convention from 1951 and the 1967 Protocol. It guarantees asylum seekers protection from being returned to a country where they, where they face serious threats to their lives or or freedom. What was not foreseen at the time of drafting was how modern communication would develop and the case with which we now travel between continents. However, President, what was foreseen was the importance of ensuring individuals the right to safe shelter and the import importance of fair proce processing of application for asylum. And President, by exporting asylum seekers to another country, the UK is showing disregard for their responsibilities as a signatory to the Ref Refugees Convention. Even if Rwanda is only a plane ride away from the United Kingdom, Rwanda is, one, is on a different continent and with far less resources when it comes to infrastructure and capacity. We know that the larger part of Rwanda's refugees population is still living in camps with limited possibilities for a better future. As the United, United High Commissioner for Refugees has, he has asked, is it fair that a rich European nation exports its, its responsibilities to a poorer country? And another question, how will British authorities be able to ensure that the asylum seekers are getting the protection they are entitled to under the Convention and precedent? The difficult migrant and refugee situation in Europe is to a large extent the result of lack of solidarity and lack of willingness to share the burden. Flying asylum seekers back to the continent many of them are fle fle fleeing from without processing their application is a disappointing short-term so, uh, short so solution. I fail to see how this can be in line with uh, obligations under international law. It is only when asylum seekers have had their applications proceeded fairly that is that it is okay to deny and return those who do not qualify for asylum. Exporting the asylum seekers to a different continent is not okay, especially when the prime motivation seems to be pleasing the electorate. electorate. Strengthening the control of the coastline would be a better solution. As a signatory of the Refugee Con Convention, the United Kingdom cannot only benefit from the Convention, it must also take the responsibility to protect and implement it. Thank you, President. Thank you, Ingrid. Now I ask uh, 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 Madam uh, Suna Eversdotter from Iceland to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Dear colleagues, the UK government may believe that they are taking a strong stance against, as a colleague mentioned it, the Strasbourg court, but they are not. It is weak politics to attack the European Court of Human Rights for domestic political purposes. It's weak. It means you have nothing left to stand for. The fact that you aim now to declare supremacy of domestic courts over the European Convention of Human Rights is weak. I seem to recall many conservative UK colleagues standing here in this hemicycle condemning Russia when it declared national law supreme over convention law. I seem to recall that, but now, now when it suits domestic purposes, all of a sudden that's okay. This, dear colleagues, is weak. It's weak politics. And I'm sorry to say it's not the only example of the states that we think should be the bearers of the message of this organization. We saw Denmark doing the same thing when they had the presidency of the Committee of Ministers. They tried to use their presidency to weaken the independence of the court. My own government in Iceland attacked the credibility of the European Court of Human Rights when they disliked their judgment about the independence of judges in Iceland. These are weak politics, dear colleagues. It should be rejected. And it shouldn't be seen as a strong man or strong kind of politics because it is just altering your opinions according to the wind. You cannot on the one hand say that you aim to enforce the convention and then on the other hand try to enact laws that go against the fundamental principles of the convention which is the primacy of the right of the European Court of Human Rights to interpret convention rights. This is something that we can never alter, and this is something that we all need to stand guard around. And there's nothing strong about trying to attack it. There's nothing protecting your own sovereignty. It's simple, weak politics trying to abuse the moment at the time for domestic purposes, and history will judge it as misjudged and weak. So I hope you stay away from this course, dear UK colleagues. You warned others against it before. You should look into the mirror now. Thank you, uh, Suna. Prochain orateur dans notre débat est M. Bernard Fournier de la France. Bernard, vous avez la parole. Merci, M. le Président, M. le Président, mes chers collègues. Le gouvernement britannique a signé un accord avec le gouvernement du Rwanda pour permettre le transfert des demandeurs d'asile arrivés illégalement sur le territoire du Royaume-Uni vers le Rwanda. C'est là que leurs demandes d'asile seront désormais examinées. Financées par Londres, à hauteur de 141 millions d'euros, ils visent à dissuader les traversées clandestines de la Manche. À son annonce, l'accord a suscité de vives critiques de groupes de défense des droits de l'homme, de personnalités de l'opposition dans les deux pays et même des Nations unies. Notre commission de l'immigration et des personnes déplacées a également dénoncé cet accord et expliqué qu'il remet en cause la Convention de Genève de 1951 relative au statut des personnes réfugiées. En effet, cette convention pose le principe de non-refoulement des demandeurs d'asile. La Cour européenne des droits de l'homme a également décidé de suspendre une décision du gouvernement britannique concernant un ressortissant irakien qui avait demandé l'asile à son arrivée au Royaume-Uni et risquait d'être refoulé vers le Rwanda dans la soirée du 14 juin 2022. Le Royaume-Uni a respecté cette décision et l'avion dans lequel il se trouvait avec plusieurs autres réfugiés n'a donc pas décollé. Mais alors que cette décision présente un caractère provisoire, en attendant que la Cour se prononce sur la recevabilité et le fond de l'affaire, elle a fait l'objet de vives critiques de la part du gouvernement britannique. La ministre de l'Intérieur, Madame Patton, a qualifié la décision de scandaleuse et jugé que la Cour avait travaillé de manière opaque sur cette affaire, alors que sa décision est fondée sur l'article 39 de son règlement, qui prévoit que des mesures provisoires peuvent être prises, à titre exceptionnel, lorsqu'en l'absence de telles mesures, le requérant est exposé à un réel risque de dommages irréparables. Plus grave encore, le gouvernement britannique a présenté hier un projet de loi 
pour remplacer l'acte de 1998, ce projet vient directement remettre en cause la primauté des décisions en arrêt de la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme dans un certain nombre de cas. Il conteste fondamentalement la doctrine de l'instrument vivant, vivant pardon, appliqué par la Cour. Ce projet me paraît aller à l'encontre des engagements pris par le Royaume-Uni. Le gouvernement britannique indique que le Royaume-Uni restera parti à la Convention, mais il suit un chemin dangereux qui sera, je n'en doute pas, exploité par certains autres États et instrumentalisé par la Fédération de Russie. Je compte sur nos collègues britanniques pour nous apporter des éléments d'information sur ce projet, mais il me paraît de notre devoir de rappeler que le Royaume-Uni a ses obligations conventionnelles. Quelle crédibilité aurions-nous face à d'autres États membres qui remettent en cause les décisions de la Cour si nous acceptons que l'une des plus anciennes démocraties d'Europe sans la franchise. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, cher Bernard. Now I call on the debate Mr. Jeremy Corbyn from the United Kingdom. Jeremy. Delighted to take part in this debate, and it's a timely one and a very important one. This Council of Europe, above all, exists as a protector of human rights across Europe. We're the protectors of the European Convention on Human Rights. We elect judges to the European Court of Human Rights. We are fundamentally about human rights. So I'm beyond disappointed that my government has done two completely wrong things in my view. Yesterday, they announced the introduction of a British Bill of Rights into the British Parliament. And that Bill of Rights is going to uh, apparently make Britain independent of what um, many of our ministers and Conservative members of Parliament choose to describe as a foreign court in respect of the European Court of Human Rights. They describe it as the Strasbourg Court, deliberately undermining what is an essential part of British justice. The 1998 Human Rights Act in Britain incorporated the Convention on Human Rights Uh, support for the Court of Human Rights and of all of its case law into British law. The British government doesn't like it because it has had one interim judgment against it of late and one in the past. The decision that was made to intervene in respect of a deportation to Rwanda is one that has annoyed and excited the British government. And I want to just put this in the context of the politics of what's going on here. There are desperate people in this world looking for a place of safety. Some of those get into flimsy dinghies and try and cross the English Channel. They risk everything in order to try to survive. The British government's solution to their misery and their fear is to remove them to Rwanda where their cases will be processed and they will for most of, the, most of them, end up remaining in Rwanda. It's the outsourcing of the right of anyone to seek asylum, a legal right that is there within the European Convention and the 1951 Geneva Convention. And I think we should just think for a moment what it is like to be so desperate that you have to try to resort to those measures in order just to survive. This body should speak up for them, the victims of war, of human rights abuse, of aggression, of poverty, and of environmental disaster, and do something different. And so, I hope that the uh, interim decision made by the European Court of Human Rights is something that pertains. But as other speakers have pointed out, if the British government is allowed to get away with this by saying with a um, split tongue, if you like, that at one hand it supports the European Convention on Human Rights and incorporates that into its law, yet at the same time saying it's not going to be bound by a foreign court. They're undermining the existing British law which gives our citizens and the citizens of every other country in Europe the right, the right to have their case heard at the European Court of Human Rights. We've got to stand by the advances made in human rights by brave people of past generations in order to protect the human rights of the most vulnerable people in this world today. Thank you, Jeremy. Now I call in the debate Mr. Paul Gavin from Ireland. Paul, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. How do we find the words to describe this new proposed law on asylum seekers in Britain? British Home Secretary Priti Patel describes it as, and I quote, first class policy. I'm going to do a first here as an Irish Republican and quote Prince Charles, who said it was appalling. 
The New Yorker magazine described it as harebrained and immoral. I would describe it as amongst the most cynical, shameful, not to mention racist proposals ever produced by a member state of the Council of Europe. What the British government is proposing is the effective outsourcing of asylum seekers to a third country, the outsourcing of their legal rights, the outsourcing of human beings. A seven-page analysis of the proposed British Rwandan scheme by the UN concluded that it was, and I quote, incompatible with the letter and spirit of the 1951 Refugee Convention. Indeed, I want to pay tribute to Leslie Griffiths, who led the initiative to table a draft declaration on behalf of members of the Committee on Migration, highlighting that incompatibility and roundly condemning the shameful proposal. It's interesting, too, to note the comments of the Law Society of England and Wales, which has stated, and again I quote, this bill will create an acceptable class of human rights abuses in the United Kingdom. If it wasn't for the intervention of the European Court of Human Rights for an urgent interim measure, this exporting of asylum seekers would have already begun. The reaction to the British government to the court's decision has been appalling, but also deeply worrying. The Tories now plan to introduce this new so-called British Bill of Rights, which will actually significantly weaken the standing of the European Court of Human Rights in Britain. It introduces a promise to clarify the law for judges so they place British laws above European Court of Human Rights rulings. It also plans to screen out some human rights claims against the government or other public bodies. People will be required to prove at the earliest possible stage that they've suffered a significant disadvantage. Finally, Mr. President, as an Irish Republican, I must highlight the impact of this proposed new law on my country. The fact that rights are set out in the European Convention are written into the Good Friday Agreement means that this new law will undermine that international legal agreement as well. The European Court of Human Rights has been an important mechanism to which citizens can turn when they've suffered grave human rights violations. In the context of conflict in Ireland, this has resulted in landmark judgments such as the McCurr Group of Cases, which saw the court rule that the victims had their Article 2 right to life breached. The importance of the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence in upholding the rights of individuals in the North and holding the British government to account cannot be us underestimated. Unfortunately, not for the first time, Mr. President, we have known nothing Tory politicians creating chaos in Ireland. Thank you, uh, Paul. Now we are going to listen to Mr. Julian Balke from Germany. Julian. First of all, the United Kingdom already has a long history in disrespect of human rights. And there is the people on a flimsy rubber boat are being stopped in the channel and being brought back. And this is what I call a border farce. De deporting people is appalling and, and unethical. Outsourcing refugees is outsourcing responsibility. And I'm standing here as a young member of the German parliament. And I say that because human rights are a consequence of the horrors in Germany's darkest times. The world learned a lesson after World War II, and the lesson was that every single individual must be granted a set of fundamental rights. Ignoring the European Courts of Human Rights is ignoring the lessons learned um, and the mutual, mutual respect for each other. And Mr. Howell, if you ask for feedback on your bill, I can give you feedback. If you want to continue to respect the European Courts of Human Rights, then also respect the judgment. This is what is at stake. Boris Johnson led UK out of the European Union, and he is now leading the UK out of European values. Thank you very much, Julian. Prochain orateur is Monsieur Simon Moutquin de, de la Belgique. Simon. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je vais me permettre de vous demander d'abord si le prochain orateur a le temps d'intervenir aussi, puisqu'il est plus concerné que moi et je vois que le délai... Ok, très bien, merci beaucoup. Euh, cher Président, chers collègues, de très nombreux membres de l'Assemblée l'ont déjà abordé. L'accord passé entre le Royaume-Uni et le Rwanda est illégal et immoral. Le renvoi de demandeurs d'asile vers le Rwanda viole toutes les règles du droit international. Amnesty International a souligné que le bilan lamentable en matière des droits humains était connu au Rwanda. Le HCR a quant à lui condamné cette pratique contraire aux droits humains et à la Convention, Europe... à la Convention de Genève. Alors certes, on doit dénoncer cet accord immoral. On doit dénoncer le non-respect des décisions de la Cour par le Royaume-Uni. Mais prenons le temps de regarder ailleurs. 
Prenons le temps de regarder ce qui est en train de s'installer sur notre continent et qu'on pourrait appeler le musée des horreurs. Au Danemark, la politique migratoire restreint d'année en année les droits des migrants, confiscation de biens, obligation de travailler pour avoir des aides sociales, renvoi des migrants prisonniers au Kosovo, projet d'une île spécialement prévue pour les migrants bientôt. En Italie, avec le support de l'Union européenne, on passe des accords avec des gardes-côtes libyens pour les renvoyer vers l'enfer de la Libye, l'enfer où la majorité des femmes sont violées toutes les semaines en Libye. En Espagne, des sans-papiers ont les mains brûlées à cause des produits qu'ils utilisent pour cultiver nos légumes payés à 3 euros de l'heure. En Croatie, en Grèce et ailleurs, les rapports sur les pushbacks se ressemblent et se répètent. Chez moi, en Belgique, actuellement, on refuse le droit d'asile à une majorité d'Afghans alors que le pays même est frappé par une terrible famine et que le pays est à nouveau au, 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 dans les mains des, des talibans. En Belgique, toujours, et je pense à eux beaucoup aujourd'hui, des centaines de sans-papiers ont entamé en vain une grève de la faim, espérant réveiller le monde politique sur leur sort et sur leur invisibilité. Alors bien sûr, nous devons dénoncer cet accord pris entre le Royaume-Uni et le Rwanda et le non-respect des décisions de la Cour. Mais parlons d'immoralité. L'immoralité, ce n'est pas que l'accord du Royaume-Uni et du Rwanda. L'immoralité, c'est cette politique migratoire dont le seul paradigme est la sécurité, la restriction, l'externalisation, l'expulsion, la répression, la peur, des barrières et des pushbacks. L'immoralité, c'est cette réalité qui veut que beaucoup d'entre nous voyagent avec un passeport partout dans le monde ou en Europe, alors que certains doivent risquer leur vie pour espérer une vie meilleure. Chers collègues, finalement, je vous appelle et je nous appelle à retrouver de la moralité dans notre politique migratoire. Changeons de paradigme, accueillons, organisons la solidarité, protégeons, écoutons les histoires de ces personnes, développons des voies sûres et légales de migration. Finalement, osons juste une autre migration. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, Simon. And the, the last speaker in this uh, uh, current affairs debate will be uh, Mr. Leslie Griffiths from the United Kingdom. Leslie, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. And I need not detain uh, the members who have been gracious enough to give me time beyond time for very long. I'd like to begin by um, a word of tribute to uh, John Howell uh, for being there and as our leader of the British delegation. Um, a word of tribute because he's actually there, the only member of the Conservative governing party who's turned up. Uh, those of us who have spoken from the United Kingdom are all from the Labour opposing side of the British Parliament. And um, it's a sad comment, and I would like to suggest to John that the next time we debate this subject, he brings them in in single file and sits them there to listen to all that's been said today. And if they had the guts to do so, to stand up and put a contrary case. It's an echo chamber for all of us to be saying what has to be said and is obvious to be said and from a different variety of points of view. But we must have the governing party here. That's what the delegation to Strasbourg is all about. And we must enforce a hearing by them of the case that's being made and has been made with, with passion and conviction and reason and intellectual probity. So that would be my very first plea. Um, I have to say, too, that um, uh, having fought battles recently for the Nationality and Borders Bill that is now on the statute book and enlisted the support of all the legal brains, the best brains in Britain in the House of Lords as it stood against the government proposals only to lose the ultimate debate because of the majority in, in the House of Commons, we now align ourselves once again around this cause to fight the same battles all over again but with different material to work with and a different focus to concentrate on. Just before we came here for this debate, um, I was present with Lord Fawkes at a meeting that uh, explained the needs of journalists in situations of war and the necessity to give journalists at the front all the support we can because they are giving us the truth of what's happening in situations of war. My friends, this is a situation of war and we must report it faithfully and not hide behind selective quotations from government documents. I read in a newspaper article this morning 
plans to make universal rights subordinate to ministerial opinion and political whim. That's not the press traducing what's happening at the moment. It's telling us the truth from the front line. Thank you very much, Sassi. I now close this debate. This is a current affairs debate, uh, which does not produce a document, a resolution. Uh, however, there has been an invitation made by our colleagues John Howell that if you have an additional comment, uh, do, uh, do forward it to, uh, to him. Uh, the Bureau will decide which, whether and which follow-up will be given to this debate. I now interrupt for a minute to change the, the, the chair, and then we will have our second current affairs debate of today. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Lors de, du jour, appelle maintenant notre second débat d'actualité sur les conséquences du blocus de la mer Noire. Ce débat sera ouvert par l'orateur désigné par le bureau, M. Oleksi Kongcharenko. Le temps de parole de chaque intervenant est fixé à trois minutes à l'exception du premier orateur désigné par le bureau qui dispose de sept minutes. La parole est à M. Oleksi Goncharenko, premier orateur désigné par le bureau. Vous avez la parole, monsieur. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, dear colleagues. I think that is extremely important debate. You all know that all this session is mostly con is about this awful war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine. And it has many dimensions on the land, but not only. Also, one of the dimensions of this war is Russian attempt to occupy the Black Sea. Yes, to occupy, because they already occupied Azov Sea and stopped any uh, activities there. Uh, only their own is on the place. And now they are trying to do it in the Black Sea, attacking the north and western part of the Black Sea and Ukrainian seaports. They are attacking not only Ukraine, but also we have at least three uh, cases of Russian Navy attacks on uh, the civilian ships. First is Millennium Spirit, tanker with a chemical cargo under flag of Moldova, which is a member state of our organization. Second is Namura Queen under flag of Panama. It was attacked by a missile and it was hit by a missile. And third is Turkish um, ship Jupiter, which was shelled and damaged by Russian Navy. As the result, the sea trade of Ukraine through Black Sea is completely stopped. Before the war, 75% of Ukrainian foreign trade was made through seaports, which is more than 150 million tons, just imagine. Seaports also handled more than 90% of Ukrainian agricultural export. And yes, agricultural export is the main issue today, because that is influencing food security in the whole world. I, I will give you just several numbers. Um, the Ukraine and Russia together generated before the invasion 30% of world exports of wheat and barley, 18% of corn export, and 80%, 80% of sunflower oil. That's why today we have a rise of prices in the supermarkets throughout the whole Europe. We have the rise of prices on sunflower oil, that it's absent. We have the rise prices of, of, on the beer because of barley, of the bread because of wheat, and 
It's here in Europe where people still can afford it, but it's difficult for people. But let's go ahead and think what is happening in other countries. Uh, the supply of wheat from Ukraine made 28% of Indonesia needs, 21% of Bangladesh needs. Together, uh, Ukraine and Russia made 80% of wheat supply of Egypt, 80%. The country with more than 100 million population. What is ahead of us? Hunger riots, starving, millions of people dying from the hunger. And millions of refugees, new wave of refugees. And where will they go? It's clear, first of all, to the countries, member states of the Council of Europe. And that is a huge challenge to the world security in general. Uh, High food prices have already increased the number of starving people in the world from 440 million to 1.6 billion people. That's according to Secret General Secretary of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez. So this awful war of Russia against Ukraine is not only killing thousands and tens of thousands of Ukrainians, but it is also will, and it will also kill millions of people throughout the whole planet with the hunger. In 1932-1933, Stalin and Soviet Russia organized a genocide of Ukrainian people, Holodomor, where from three to five millions of Ukrainians died starving. And now Putin, as a good student of Stalin, is making the same Holodomor, genocide, food attack, but on the whole world. Like a real terrorist, he took as a hostages millions, hundreds of millions of people in the world. From the calories in Ukrainian crops, more than 400 million people are dependent in the, on the planet. It means that they are now hostages of Putin and his absolutely awful activity in the Black Sea. And uh, the main thing uh, that Ukraine is trying to do our best to send our crops by other ways, by uh, railway, by outer routes. But I can tell you that unfortunately, it's impossible for us to replace the seaports. We are trying our best, but still we are making up to 20, 25% of our monthly uh, export before, because we can't replace in short term uh, seaports and the sea. So what should be done? I think that is the most important. First of all, you are all parliamentarians. Please address your governments to react and to react. Uh, we need uh, to find solution. It can be convoys protecting their uh, ships with the grain coming from Ukrainian ports, together with providing Ukraine by the weaponry which will stop Russian Navy activity in the north and western part of the Black Sea. That is the first uh, option. Second option, every day millions of barrels of Russian oil is crossing Bosphorus. If, uh, why are we not using this leverage? And I address to Turkey and other member states of NATO and our you know, Council of Europe. If we can say to Russia, either Ukrainian grain and your oil is passing through Bosphorus or nothing is passing. If you are disrupting humanitarian situation on the whole planet, we will react and we should say to this. And the decision should be found very quickly because new harvest collection already started in Ukraine. And in one month, the situation would be even much worse. Ukrainian farmers don't have storages where to store the, the grain, don't have finances to finance the campaign. That's something we should do now. And I address to you, next week will be NATO summit in Madrid, and your governments can react, and I'm sure should react, from humanitarian reasons, first of all. And last but not the least, our organization. I believe that Council of Europe should react too. I think that we, uh, we should not disappear for several months now till October. I propose to the president and to the bureau, tomorrow will be bureau, to make a special session of pace, uh, end of July, not here in Strasbourg. Better, the, the best option is in Odessa, my native city, which is the biggest city on the Black Sea. If security does not allow Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, let's do it. If not session, some special events, some finding visits, we need to do it now in order to prevent starving of millions. This is our responsibility. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur Goncharenko. Au nom, au nom du groupe GUE, la parole est à Monsieur 
George Catrugalus uh, de la Grèce. Vous avez la parole, monsieur. Merci, merci, madame la présidente. The previous speaker has uh, uh, very well demonstrated how Ukraine is not just uh, the breadbasket for Europe, but uh, for the rest uh, of the world as well. And he has also demonstrated that the biggest risk is now for vulnerable countries, like uh, especially those in Africa. And there are cases like the one uh, he has mentioned of Egypt, that has a dependence of more than 80%. There are other countries uh, in the sub-Saharan sub uh, area, and especially in East Africa, Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, which depend on both Russia and Ukraine for 90% of their wheat. And we are speaking about the most poor regions of the planet. Add to that a systemic failure we had already to face the consequences of the pandemic in these countries, and also regional wars like that in Ethiopia and uh, Tigray, which has already started a famine. So we have immediate reasons for taking action. And the uh, previous speaker has mentioned military means that could be used. I have uh, myself read proposals like that of the retired Admiral James Tavridis, a former NATO commander, about how, to, how a flotilla could uh, uh, escort merchant ships, or how about uh, more anti-ship missiles could uh, uh, have a deterrent effect on the Russian fleet. Problem with this kind of uh, uh, military action is that uh, cannot guarantee by themselves the freedom of uh, ship uh, going out from the ports of Ukraine, which must be a number one priority. I believe that uh, it is uh, one of the best examples for which diplomacy stands out to be the best tool to provide a solution. On Monday, the, Euro the EU ministers are discussing how we could have an agreement under the, Euro the United Nations auspices in order to reach a solution by which safe sea corridors could be uh, implemented in the Black Sea in order to export Ukrainian grain. And uh, I think this could be a precursor, a precedent for a diplomatic solution in uh, the war which would fully respect the Ukrainian legitimate interests, but also, based on international law, could give a way out to the war and the crisis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Monsieur, euh, merci, Monsieur Catrugalus. Au nom du Parti Socialiste, la parole est à Monsieur Pierre-Alain Fides de la Suisse. Pierre-Alain, vous avez la parole. Merci, Madame la Vice-Présidente. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers collègues. Cette guerre de la Russie contre l'Ukraine collectionne les effets collatéraux. On connaissait le drame du peuple ukrainien, les destructions systématiques, les atteintes inqualifiables aux droits de l'homme. On connaissait la crise énergétique avec l'envolée du prix du gaz et du pétrole, l'inflation, la pauvreté énergétique qui s'installe dans certains pays. Et voilà maintenant la crise du blé. C'est utiliser cette histoire comme une arme de déstabilisation par Vladimir Poutine pour faire pression sur l'Occident en exigeant la fin des sanctions contre son pays. L'Ukraine, c'est l'un des greniers à blé du monde, on vient d'en parler. Les silos à grains sont pleins à rabord en Ukraine, sans possibilité d'exporter. Le blocus euh, russe dans la mer Noire, euh, la présence de mines en grande quantité pour protéger le territoire euh, ukrainien, l'accès à Odessa, tout ça, ce sont des choses qui empêchent d'imaginer à court et moyen terme l'utilisation de la mer noire pour exporter les, les biens produits par, euh, par l'Ukraine. On peut imaginer des mesures militaires, mais c'est un risque d'escalade énorme. Et comme l'a dit avant M. Petrogalos, c'est clair qu'en aucune manière les, les navires seraient protégés. 
On pourrait imaginer de faire un accord avec les Russes, enlever les mines euh, ukrainiennes, mais on sait qu'on ne peut pas faire confiance aux Russes qui sont experts dans l'art du mensonge. Les conséquences humanitaires sont énormes dans ce domaine, surtout en ce qui concerne l'Afrique. La famine annoncée pour des dizaines, des centaines de millions de personnes vont faire des dégâts considérables. C'est une question de quantité et de prix, car il faut de l'argent pour pouvoir acheter ce blé qui va devenir toujours plus cher. Concrètement, pour des temps prolongés, la voie maritime par la mer Noire est inexploitable et c'est là où il faut trouver une solution. Il faut trouver une solution immédiate pour tenter d'exporter le plus possible de ce blé ukrainien. Mais je pense qu'au même titre que nous devons, nous, les pays occidentaux, accélérer notre transition énergétique pour ne pas dépendre du gaz et du pétrole russe à l'avenir, il faut également trouver une solution pérenne pour l'exportation du blé ukrainien. Et là, j'ai entendu une idée, notamment exprimée par M. Macron, c'était le développement d'une voie ferrée très efficace, très rapide, par la Roumanie. C'est une solution qui est compliquée, parce qu'il y a des problèmes d'écartement de voie. C'est une solution qui est chère, c'est une solution qui n'a pas un effet immédiat, mais je ne sais pas s'il y a une autre alternative, car il faut assumer les choses pour le moyen, peut-être le long terme, et ça me paraît la seule euh, possibilité que la géographie nous offre. Merci pour votre attention. Merci, Pierre Alain. Au nom du groupe PPE, la parole est à M. Alexander Bosiek de la Pologne. Vous avez la parole, monsieur. Euh, merci, Madame la Présidente. Euh, toujours mon nom, ça donne quelques problèmes. Pochei. Euh, merci beaucoup euh, à M. Goncharenko euh, pour euh, cette introduction. Et il est juste et il est absolument, absolument, absolument nécessaire. Nul ne dirait pas s'étonner que nous traitons cette tragédie, la guerre en Ukraine, des différentes perspectives et avec une dense attention. Again and again and again. Mais nous devons le faire parce que ça porte le préjudice et c'est très dangereux. Et cette guerre n'est pas seulement une tragédie pour l'Ukraine. Ce n'est pas seulement une menace imminente pour les pays baltes, Pologne, Moldavie, Roumanie et Slovaquie. Toute l'Europe est concentrée. Mais là, nous découvrons que non seulement l'Europe est concernée. Avec la, euh, le blocus des portes ukrainiennes, avec le blocus de la mer Noire, la guerre menée par la fédération russe porte atteinte à la stabilité du région méditerranéenne, surtout les pays du sud-est du région. Cet blocus crée euh, une situation extrêmement dangereuse et peut provoquer la famine et les réactions qui peuvent mener et qui peuvent dégénérer en quelque chose comme le printemps arabe, mais d'une mauvaise manière. Déjà au Maroc, le gouvernement, pour apaiser la situation, doit verser des millions de dollars par mois pour apaiser la situation, pour maintenir la paix sociale et subventionner les prix de céréales. Dans les autres pays du région, la situation est même plus grave et chaque semaine s'aggrave de la manière très dangereuse encore une fois. Et permettez-moi de faire une observation très personnel. Je suis très heureux que dans cette maison, dans notre assemblée, tout à coup, tous les Européens ont commencé à comprendre que ce ne sont pas des problèmes de l'Est de l'Europe avec la Russie, mais ce sont les problèmes concernant toute l'Europe. Et c'est jamais vu avec M. Goncharenko Aujourd'hui, on était invité à la radio française dans le meilleur temps, 
et on a parlé des Ukraines. Je ne peux pas m'imaginer la même situation il y a quelques mois, il y a quelques années. Je suis persuadé que ces changements de conscience, c'est quelque chose de plus important que ce qui s'est passé depuis quatre mois. Merci beaucoup. Merci, M. Pochier. Et au nom de, du groupe des conservateurs européens, la parole à M. Dimitro Natala, Nataluka de l'Ukraine. Vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mrs. Chairman, and uh, of course, my dear colleague Alex for bringing this forward. Ladies and gentlemen, before the February of 24, some 800 million people were starving in the world. Now, regions such as MENA, uh, where the food basket has risen in some places by 100 or 200 percent, are threatened by crisis in unprecedented in decades. Countries such as Lebanon, Egypt, Yemen, Libya, Qatar, Somalia are critically dependent on Ukraine's ability to supply its agricultural products. Russians' actions, however, uh, are hitting the most vulnerable countries uh, when, where even small price increases endanger millions of people. But developing countries are not the only ones suffering from Russia's aggression. EU consumer prices have risen more than 8% since the beginning of the war. Most importantly, producer prices rose in the EU by 37%. And the increase in prices applies exactly to those goods that are the most basic and accessible to all citizens. Now, imagine that you're a typical German who a year ago paid one euro for a sandwich with a sausage. Today, you have to pay two euros because the bun was made from the Ukrainian grain and the butter was delivered from Ukraine or made from Ukrainian milk. Moreover, the favorite beer of Germans was also, will also become more expensive because local brewers often use Ukrainian barley that is being blocked in the port of Odessa. Italians will pay much more for their customer spaghetti as prices for pasta in Italy have doubled in some places due to the lack of Ukrainian wheat. Exactly the same trend exists in Britain, where the fish and chips have gone up by 20% in the UK because they're being fried in Ukrainian sunflower oil. Finally, you go to France and you eat the brie cheese, which has gone up in 28% increase in price. Same for the Ukrainian milk and dead corn that has been fed to the French cows. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the rise in price of confectionery, dairy products and vegetables is a planned operation to undermine stability in Europe, directly targeting vulnerable populations with the middle and bottom incomes, and even in the most developed countries. What to say if even the perfumes and the clothes are getting even more expensive because of lack of supplies of Ukrainian raw materials? Russia has consistently disrupted supply chains around the world, risking starvation in developing countries and driving up inflation in Europe unseen in decades. Its main goal is to disintegrate, destabilize and undermine security around the world. Now, this is not just a blackmail. This is terror by which Russia threatens the whole world. Russia is the horseman of the apocalypse who brings war, famine and death. And this is the duty of the entire world community to give a stern response of Russia's barbaric behavior. One option is to provide a safe corridor for the export of Ukrainian goods. This is the establishing, under the aegis of the UN, of a humanitarian safe haven over the port of Odessa, the most correct and optimal option for solving the problem of the food crisis caused by Russian aggression. This initiative should be urgently put to vote in the UN General Assembly as it directly concerns every country. We must make every effort to unblock the ports of the Black Sea and allow the whole world, which is now held hostage by Russia, to breathe freely. Finally, the last proposition is to hold a joint PACE and NATO Parliamentary Assembly session to address this very specific issue. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur Nataluka. Au nom du groupe ADL, la parole à Monsieur Damien Coutier. De la Suisse. Vous avez la parole, monsieur. Merci, madame la présidente, chers et chers collègues. Nous avons raison dans cette assemblée de faire un débat sur cette importante question parce que nous sommes face à un des plus grands risques de crise internationale qui découle de, de, deux, de deux autres crises, finalement, de la crise ukrainienne, alors de l'agression russe de, de l'Ukraine et d'autre part aussi du changement climatique, puisque la, la situation dans laquelle nous nous trouvons, d'une part, est liée à l'agression russe contre, contre l'Ukraine et, et les blocages qui en découlent, mais aussi de, de mauvaises récoltes du côté de la Chine, euh, d'une vague de chaleur euh, incroyable du côté de l'Inde, 
euh, et d'autres événements euh, locaux de ce type liés au changement climatique qui, euh, qui rendent la situation très, très dangereuse euh, au niveau des, des, de l'accès aux ressources alimentaires mondiales. Euh, en l'occurrence, euh, euh, l'Ukraine et la Russie prises ensemble représentent 30% à peu près de la production du blé et de l'orge au niveau mondial, 15% de la production de maïs et, et 75% euh, des, du tournesol. Et on, on l'a dit, les prix ont augmenté massivement euh, ces dernières semaines et cela a causé, ça a été évoqué ce chiffre des Nations Unies par euh, notre collègue M. Goncharenko, cela peut causer un risque alimentaire pour euh, entre à peu près 500 millions de personnes et un milliard et demi de personnes. Ce sont les chiffres de, de l'ONU. Donc nous sommes face à une situation extrêmement importante, extrêmement grave. Euh, ce risque est particulièrement fort en Afrique du Nord et au, et au Proche-Orient. L'histoire montre que souvent les guerres sont, sont liées à des famines. C'est vrai, mais ça n'est pas une fatalité. Et, et pour éviter cette fatalité, eh bien on doit compter sur la sagesse des hommes et des femmes, sur la volonté des, des gouvernements et des, et des politiques, et donc sur la, sur la diplomatie. Plusieurs pistes ont été évoquées aujourd'hui, j'aimerais aussi en invoquer quelques-unes. C'est important de travailler diplomatiquement au déblocage de la mer Noire, d'essayer de créer des, 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 des canaux qui permettent d'accéder à, à Odessa. Ça implique des discussions avec le gouvernement ukrainien euh, sur ce sujet-là, puisqu'il y, y a des mines de protection, avec le gouvernement russe pour qu'on arrive à, à faciliter le passage, probablement des efforts internationaux pour escorter ces, navi ces navires, et aussi des, des discussions avec le gouvernement turc qui a euh, bloqué l'accès pour les belligérants euh, à ces euh, euh, détroits. Euh, cela implique aussi que le gouvernement de la Roumanie fasse tous les efforts nécessaires euh, pour euh, qu'on puisse accéder au passage du, du Danube. Cela implique que les différents gouvernements nationaux ne bloquent pas les exportations ou les importations, parce qu'il y a cette tendance au protectionnisme dans ce genre de crise qui n'est pas euh, de bon conseil. Ça peut aussi euh, impliquer que certains gouvernements limitent la production euh, de carburant basé sur, euh, sur des produits végétaux et certains gouvernements sont déjà allés dans ce sens. Et ça peut impliquer aussi évidemment euh, d'autres voies euh, euh, d'exportation de ces céréales de la part de l'Ukraine. On a parlé de la Roumanie, peut-être aussi du côté de la, de la mer Baltique. Il faut une volonté politique forte pour résoudre cette crise parce que nous ne devons pas ajouter une crise immense, une crise de famine immense au plan international, aux différentes crises que notre planète connaît déjà et chacune et chacun d'entre nous euh, euh, ferait bien d'intervenir dans ce sens, non seulement des cette assemblée, mais aussi auprès des gouvernements euh, de nos différents pays. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. Merci, Monsieur Cotier. La parole est à Monsieur Bernard Fournier de la France. Vous avez la parole, Monsieur. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Mes chers collègues, l'agression de l'Ukraine par la Fédération de Russie a un impact mondial. Aux destructions des villes, aux exactions, au déplacement de population s'ajoute le risque d'une famine mondiale. Les troupes russes s'occupent en effet des terres arables, détruisent des infrastructures agricoles et imposent un blocus au port ukrainien de la mer Noire. Ainsi, plus aucune marchandise ne rentre ou ne sort du plus grand port ukrainien au dessin. Le président Zelensky a estimé qu'actuellement entre 20 et 25 millions de tonnes de céréales sont bloquées et que ce chiffre pourrait monter à 75 millions de tonnes dès cet automne, compte tenu de la nouvelle récolte qui débutera dès la fin du mois. Or, en 2019, 54 millions de tonnes de céréales et d'oléagineux avaient été exportées depuis l'Ukraine, notamment en destination de l'Afrique. Les prix des tarifs alimentaires et des engrais ont, depuis le début de la guerre, monté en flèche. Dès lors, les marchés mondiaux risquent d'être affectés, avec d'une part une hausse des prix qui va, devenir, qui va venir alimenter une inflation déjà élevée dans le monde, et d'autre part des pénuries qui pourraient gravement affecter les populations sur l'ensemble des continents. Le risque de voir des, apparaître des situations de famine est bien réel, d'autant plus que les exportations ukrainiennes de blé se font vers des pays à faible revenu. Je pense ainsi au Liban où sévit actuellement une grave crise économique et financière qui dépend pour près de 80% de l'Ukraine pour, pour ses importations de blé. De même, 60% du blé importé par la Somalie vient de l'Ukraine. Selon l'ONU, des dizaines de millions de personnes sont sur le point de devenir ou sont déjà 
en situation d'insécurité alimentaire. La Russie essaye aujourd'hui de convaincre les pays touchés que ce sont les sanctions européennes à l'encontre de la Russie et de la Biélorussie qui sont à l'origine de la hausse des prix des denrées alimentaires et des engrais, ce qu'il faudrait dès lors abandonner, les abandonner. Ce discours est tout simplement faux et nous devons le combattre. Le seul responsable de l'inflation, c'est la Russie qui se livre à un véritable chantage par la faim. C'est bien la guerre lancée par la Russie qui met en danger la sécurité alimentaire mondiale en bloquant des millions de tonnes de céréales ukrainiennes et en bombardant les terres et infrastructures agricoles de l'Ukraine. Il faut obtenir la mise en place de corridors sécurisés permettant la reprise du trafic en mer Noire. Pour cela, tous les efforts diplomatiques seront les bienvenus. Une aide technique devrait également être apportée à l'Ukraine pour permettre le déminage des eaux proches du port d'Odessa. La France s'est d'ores et déjà engagée à soutenir toute initiative diplomatique permettant à nouveau la circulation des marchandises à apporter et à apporter une aide technique pour le déminage. Mes chers collègues, la situation est particulièrement préoccupante. Nous devons mobiliser nos gouvernements sur cette question pour éviter une catastrophe humanitaire. Je vous remercie. Merci, Monsieur Fournier. La parole est à Madame Lézia de Vasilienko de l'Ukraine. Vous avez la parole, Madame. Merci, Madame la Présidente, chers collègues. Uh, I will start with a quote. Uh, the famine will start now, and they will lift the sanctions and be friends with us because they will realize that it's impossible not to be friends with us. These are the words of uh, Margarita Simonyan, the chief editor of Russia's main state-controlled propaganda channel during the uh, Petersburg Economic Forum just earlier this week. The, everything you need to know about Russia and its plans regarding the global food crisis is in that quote. The sad thing is that that quote is partly true. The famine is about to begin. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that from 8 to 13 million additional people will face undernourishment in 2022-23 if Ukraine will be unable to export its grain. Ukraine today feeds over 400 million people globally. Most of them live in North Africa and the Middle East. Some countries, like Egypt, buy up to 80% of their total grain supplies from Ukraine. Every year, we export 58 million tons of agricultural commodities and we ship 90% of it through the seaports of Azov and the Black Sea. Right now, we have 25 million tons of grain which are stuck in silos across Ukraine. In a few months, there will be even more as the harvest will start to be collected. Despite the fact that 13% of our agricultural land is covered in landmines, despite the shortage of fuel and fertilizer and the bomb storage facilities, we have managed to plant and expect to harvest 80% of all arable land in Ukraine. Instead of being exported, however, this grain sits blocked by Russian warships. And worse, Russia continues to target the silos with its missiles and artillery. The destruction of agricultural facilities, however, is not a mere coincidence or accident or collateral damage. Russia carefully plans all of its operations, and hunger today is used by Russia as a weapon of war. Russia uses it to massively destabilize the global economy and political world order. The return of famine in Africa will cause security threats in the region and a new scale of migration to Europe and the West. And knowing all of this, we have a duty and an interest to act as an international community. First of all, we must together approach the whole situation with full awareness of the manipulations and withstand the blackmail coming from the Kremlin. And second, we must keep talking to the global south, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, to make them see Russia for the empire of evil it really is. And third, we must realize that Russia is sabotaging all negotiations on the food corridors. And here I will echo my colleagues Alexei Honcharenko and Mitro Nataluha in saying that each of us must urge our respective governments to push for a collective UN resolution on the setting up of a food humanitarian safe haven on Odessa and the deployment of special grain keeping missions in other Black Sea ports. Alternatively, we must make sure that Ukraine gets enough weapons and in due time to make sure that it protects the global grain that is necessary to provide for global stability. Thank you. Merci, Madame Vasilenko. 
la, la parole est à M. Uh, Ahmed Ildis de la Turquie. Vous avez la parole, M. Thank you, Madam Chair, dear colleagues. From the start of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, we have been discussing the consequences. These consequences are far beyond Ukraine, even Europe, and include food security, which we are talking here. Ongoing war cast a tragic light on the need to promote food security, both within Europe and around the world. In addition to deteriorating situation in Ukraine, the war will have serious consequences on the global food supply chain, as we witness. This situation poses a major problem for countries which are dependent on imports from Russia and Ukraine. Continuing blockade of the Black Sea will have more impacts for millions already caught in growing hunger crisis around the world, and it will continue in the ongoing months. A safe corridor must be established for grains without time-consuming demining efforts. This imminent crisis can only be overcome by joint actions as well as regional and international cooperation. To this end, Turkey is actively taking part in the relevant multilateral initiatives at the UN, G20, and other international organizations in continuous consultation with all parties, especially Ukraine. In this regard, we support the UN's plan and sincerely cooperate with all sides to establish these corridors. Also, as expressed by for our foreign minister, we, are, we declared we are ready to host a meeting in Istanbul to hammer out the details of the plan if the sides come to an agreement. Recently, President Erdogan talked to UN Secretary General on ensuring the export of Ukrainian grains over the Black Sea, which would be effective in terms of averting a global food crisis, as well as reviving the peace negotiations and end the war through diplomacy. Moreover, increasing energy prices are pushing higher the cost of fertilizers. This is part of food security in return increases the cost of agricultural products and complicates the access to food for many across the globe. To mitigate effective, negative effects of the food security of the conflict, well-planned and well-targeted economic and technical interventions should be made. As a Black Sea riparian state with the longest, with the longest, with the longest coastline, Turkey will continue to make all efforts in order to contribute to end the blockade for ships transporting grains and related products. Dear colleagues, in conclusion, what I can assure you that Turkey, being a major buyer of Ukraine, Ukrainian grains and other agricultural products, and having the major responsibilities on the security of the Black Sea, and having developed strategic defense industry relationship with Ukraine during peacetime, is trying its best to play its unique role in close coordination with Ukraine. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Ildis. Uh, la parole est à Madame Larisa de Bilozir de l'Ukraine. Vous avez la parole, Madame, s'il vous plaît. Thank you, uh, dear chair, dear colleagues. In a report about the role of Council of Europe in security uh, this Tuesday, uh, was stressed that migrants, uh, energy and food are being weaponized by Russia. As the barbaric war was launched, a terrorist country, Russia, is creating all kinds of crises, energy crisis, ecocide. Now it's using food crisis as a weapon. After the failure of uh, Blitzkrieg, Russia moved to Plan B, destroying all of Ukrainian infrastructure and economy, logistic chains, mining fields, keeping in mind that Ukraine as an agricultural country is key to global food security. By blocking seaports that provided 90% of Ukrainian export, Russia pl is plans to use large-scale large famine as another weapon against the world. 
even ill if all measures of the action plan of the EU Ukraine solidarity lines adopted by a Euro Commission to facilitate Ukrainian agriculture are undermined without the blocking thousand uh, Ukrainian ports this plan will not um, help some, uh, substantially at best we will export not one million tons of grain but two million tons when we need three times more and now even now it's not profitable to export or uh, wheat uh, to uh, to Europe or outside because uh, the cost of logistics is times more than the cost of uh, wheat inside Ukraine at the same time the number of IDPs reached 8 million Ukrainians therefore today Ukraine ne needs uh, 15,000 tons of food per day for you to understand what has been brought to Ukraine from UN and EU humanitarian organizations, canned poultry, corn and buckwheat porridges, pastas. When this value-added products could be easily produced here in Ukraine and bought by humanitarian organizations three times less inside, rather than we have headache now how to export agricultural raw products, uh, uh, cereals and re-import uh, value-added products. So we ask you to help to rebuild agricultural economy, to co-finance projects or, uh, in relatively safe uh, areas such as central and west of Ukraine on processing agricultural products. I personally also do not expect the ports to be unblocked until the end of war. Uh, the way out today can be to provide an international humanitarian convoy by NATO ships. But what is more realistic? Support of your countries to kick out Russia from Ukraine. So to improve food security situation, we need anti-ship missiles, harpoon, an air defense system, as Russia is bombing our ports every day, grain elevators in Odessa, in Mykolaiv, and even today they bombed uh, one of the terminal, agricultural terminal in uh, Mykolaiv. So, uh, so far, there are some pre-agreements pre between Russia and Turkey on the export of Ukrainian grain without our consent, and we urge our Turkish friends, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. We cannot believe any arrangements with Russia. We are required to demand uh, the sea around Odessa and what, we, uh, what are the guarantees? Demand the sea and tomorrow Russians will be in Odessa. Therefore, I see only one way out. Pressure on Russia to withdraw its troops from Ukraine and then all war-related problems will be solved on their own. Thank you. Merci, Madame Bielosi. La parole est à Monsieur Larry Brock de, du Canada. Vous avez la parole, Monsieur. Merci, Madame Présidente, a cher collègue. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to what may be the greatest challenge facing the world today. The blockade of the Black Sea has stripped Russia's war in Ukraine of any pretense. It is not just an unprovoked aggression against Ukraine, but against the whole world. The UN estimates that 1.6 billion people globally are exposed to the unprecedented cost of living crisis unleashed by Russia on food, fuel, and finance. Russia's blockade in the Black Sea, meant to punish Ukraine, is punishing vulnerable people everywhere, including in war-torn countries such as Yemen and Syria. 50 million people in 45 countries are currently experiencing emergency levels of hunger, a situation that risks getting worse the longer Russia's blockade is maintained. At a time when help is needed more than ever, Russia's blockade also makes providing help more difficult. The World Food Program estimates that it is paying 44% more for food aid today than in 2019. Canada has been unequivocal in its condemnation of Russia's global aggression on the hungry. Last month, we joined our G7 colleagues in committing to concrete action to address the consequences of Russia's blockade. This includes supporting the agricultural sector in Ukraine to harvest, store, and transport products to world markets. The G7 has also committed to increasing food aid to those facing famine, including through the World Food Program. As a major agricultural resource exporter, Canada and Canadians are doing what we can to help address global shortages. 
For example, Nutrien, the world's largest fertilizer company based in Saskatoon, recently announced that it will increase potash output by 40% in 2025 in response to global shortages caused by the war in Ukraine. The focus right now is rightly on meeting the immediate needs of the hungry and bringing an end to the blockade. But we must also consider the lessons we must learn from Russia's aggression. We in Canada, like you in Europe, have learned that we can no longer afford to be agnostic regarding the source of essential resources. Supply chains must become resilient and less dependent on authoritarian regimes. In this context, it is all the more important to recognize the fifth anniversary of the comprehensive economic trade agreement between Canada and the EU. Such agreements promote exactly the type of economic relations that Canada and Europe must pursue, trade between responsible, sustainable producers and like-minded countries. Thank you, colleagues. Merci, Monsieur Brock. La liste des orateurs est épuisée. Je vous rappelle qu'à l'issue du débat d'actualité, l'Assemblée n'est pas appelée à voter. Ce débat aura permis un échange de vues intéressants entre les membres de l'Assemblée. Merci à toutes et à tous. L'ordre du jour rappelle à la discussion du, du rapport sur l'examen du partenariat pour la démocratie concernant le Parlement de la République kirghiz, présenté par M. Jacques Maire au nom de la Commission des questions politiques et de la démocratie. Document 15526, ainsi que l'avis présenté par M. Seri Kalchenko au nom de la Commission des questions juridiques et des droits de l'homme, document 15553. Je vous rappelle que nous devrons en avoir terminé avec l'examen de ce texte, vote inclus, à 10 h et 10 minutes. 18 h et 10 minutes. Nous devrons donc interrompre la liste des orateurs vers 17 h 40 minutes afin de pouvoir entendre la réplique de la Commission et de procéder au vote nécessaire. Je rappelle que les rapporteurs disposent d'un temps de parole de 7 minutes pour la présentation de son rapport et de 5 minutes pour répondre aux orateurs à la fin de la discussion générale. Monsieur le rapporteur, Jacques Maire, vous avez la parole. Chère Présidente, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers collègues, chers amis, euh, nous ne parlons pas très souvent du Kyrgyzstan dans cette Assemblée. Euh, nous allons probablement le faire plus fréquemment dans les semaines qui viennent et les mois qui viennent. Kyrgyzstan est une ancienne république soviétique, voisine de la Chine, 
est le seul pays de la région de l'Asie centrale qui a une culture démocratique. C'est également le premier et l'unique partenaire que nous avons pour la démocratie en Asie centrale. L'octroi du statut de partenaire pour la démocratie n'était pas une évidence en 2014, mais un pari fait par notre Assemblée avec cette société démocratique. Le, repas, le pari repose sur cette volonté de coopérer. C'est un pari qui n'est pas donné. C'est un engagement de convergence de la part des parties prenantes. L'intention du Parlement kirghiz en 2014, le Yogor Ganesh, était claire. Il avait affirmé et partagé les valeurs défendues par le Conseil de l'Europe et il a pris une série d'engagements politiques précis énoncés au paragraphe 4, 4 de la résolution de 2014. Il s'est également résolu à lutter prioritairement contre le manque d'impartialité et d'indépendance de la justice, les pratiques généralisées de corruption et de torture, l'impunité des agents de, de force de l'ordre qui en sont les auteurs, les actes d'intimidation de la société civile ou bien encore les conséquences irrésolues des tensions interethniques. Au-delà de ces déclarations, que s'est-il passé Selon la résolution qui a conféré ce statut au Kyrgyzstan, l'Assemblée aurait dû évaluer ce partenariat deux ans plus tard. Cependant, aucun des trois rapporteurs à qui la Commission avait nommé cette mission avant moi n'a pu, pour différentes raisons, mener son travail à son terme. En novembre 2020, d'importants troubles politiques ont éclaté dans le pays et la regrettée collègue Dame Cheryl Gillan a rappelé la nécessité d'évaluer ce partenariat. Alors, huit ans après l'obtention du statut, le pari fait en 2014 a-t-il été réussi, perdu, gagnant, prometteur J'ai été nommé rapporteur en 2021 pour proposer une réponse à cette question. Avec l'accord de la Commission, j'ai fait une visite à Bishkek du 22 au 24 mars dernier, représentant, rencontré des représentants des gouvernements, du Parlement, de la société civile, des organisations internationales. Et puis, j'ai dressé un bilan euh, dans un rapport à la Commission, un bilan de nos huit années de partenariat. Et je souhaite aussi remercier ici M. Kalchenko, le rapporteur pour avis, dans lequel vous indiquez souscrire au projet de résolution proposé et partager les principaux points. Dans ce bilan, il y a des éléments positifs. D'abord, évidemment, la volonté du Kyrgyzstan de rester sur la voie de la démocratie, malgré les pressions des voisins autoritaires de la zone. On pense au Kazakhstan, à la Russie et à la Chine en particulier. La parole donnée plus régulièrement par, la par les autorités à la population, notamment par les voies référendaires. La promotion de la participation des femmes et des minorités à la vie politique, même si la réforme récente via le scrutin uninominal a porté atteinte à ce respect. Des élections considérées par les observateurs internationaux comme acceptables malgré la pratique d'achat de vote. Et puis, euh, il y a aussi des, certaines réticences. Euh, je ne vais pas reprendre dans, ma, dans mon rapport la chronique de la crise politique qui a secoué ce pays depuis la victoire aux élections de M. Genbekov et puis la confrontation de ce dernier euh, avec Mme, M. Atambayev, la crise politique, les élections législatives de d'octobre 2020 et puis l'important recul démocratique qui a suivi. Je mentionnerai en fait particulièrement le rythme effréné des scrutins et des réformes menées par les autorités avec une succession de réformes constitutionnelles et institutionnelles, politiques et juridiques, de référendums et qui sont liées en même temps à un désengagement de la population qui s'est traduit par un taux de participation au scrutin de plus en plus faible. Ceci dit, les interlocuteurs kirghiz euh, ajoutaient à juste titre qu'il fallait réformer le système parce que le Parlement, qui était un lieu de tension et de corruption, avait rendu ce pays à peu près ingouvernable. Ceci étant, la situation politique et constitutionnelle reste controversée. La Constitution est devenue celle d'un régime présidentiel, certes, ce qui n'est pas un problème en soi, mais malheureusement, l'équilibre des pouvoirs n'a pas été vraiment conservé, malgré les recommandations de la Commission de Venise. Concernant la PCE, je ne peux que constater la faible implication des collègues qui aguisent. Alors bien sûr, 17 heures de temps de transport, bien sûr la pandémie, mais malgré tout, les contacts n'ont pas été fréquents. J'aimerais euh, effectivement faire en sorte de revenir sur nos préoccupations concernant les récentes atteintes aux droits de l'homme. Elles sont relatives aux questions de genre, à la pratique de la torture, aux traitements inhumains, notamment en garde à vue ou en détention, ou encore des difficultés quant aux droits d'expression et aux libertés fondamentales de réunion. 
le Parlement kirghiz pourrait effectivement réaffirmer plus fortement qu'aujourd'hui son attachement aux libertés fondamentales en abrogeant des dispositions contestables de certaines lois modifiées récemment, telles que celles sur les agents étrangers ou celles sur la protection des informations fausses et inexactes. En effet, je crois qu'au moment de ce retour d'expérience, de ce bilan, nous souhaitons rappeler aux autorités kirghizes leurs engagements et nous leur demandons d'être particulièrement vigilantes sur les pressions exercées par les, sur les médias et ONG. Ces pressions portent atteinte à de multiples reprises à la vitalité de la société kirghize. Ceci étant, nous avons aussi constaté que les autorités kirghizes étaient extrêmement ouvertes au dialogue et les organisations internationales et de droits de l'homme présentes sur place nous disent que les dialogues ont de l'impact et qu'elles font évoluer la, po la position des autorités. Je relève pour terminer le contexte international particulier dans lequel se situe le Kyrgyzstan, très dépendant de la Russie. Il a quand même voulu jouer de son autonomie et de son indépendance pour accompagner dans ses prises de position la souveraineté de l'Ukraine alors que les pressions étaient fortes. Ma conclusion est simple. Les résultats ne sont pas là, mais les intentions restent positives. Nous devons partir désormais, au bout de huit années, des intentions vers des avancées concrètes. Et le plus important, c'est quand même la convergence juridique entre le Kyrgyzstan et les conseils de l'Europe. Sur des sujets qui parlent à nos opinions publiques, la protection des droits des citoyens, les violences faites aux femmes, etc. Depuis l'octroi de la de le partenariat, la, la, le Kyrgyzstan n'a absolument adhéré à aucune convention ni aucun accord partiel de l'Europe, du Conseil de l'Europe, alors qu'il s'était engagé à le faire. Il y a des intentions positives là aussi, donc ma conclusion est simple. Je propose que nous ayons deux ans devant nous pour laisser la chance aux Kyrgyz qui ont cette volonté et cette intention de concrétiser leur engagement. Si au bout de deux ans, ils commencent à participer dans notre espace de débat et de droit, ce sera très positif et nous pourrons aller à de l'avant. Si ce n'est pas le cas, évidemment, nous pourrons réévaluer le partenariat en tirant les conséquences des résultats qui ont été obtenus. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, monsieur le rapporteur, cher Jacques. Maintenant, euh, euh, la parole est pour M. Euh, Kalchenko. Euh, euh, vous avez la parole pour pr présenter l'avis de la Commission. Vous êtes en ligne euh, et vous avez euh, trois minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Dear President, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to congratulate Mr. Jacques Mayer, rapporteur of the Committee on Political Affairs and Democracy. I thank him for his report that thoroughly addresses the political, legal, and institutional developments in Kyrgyzstan since 2014, when Partner for Democracy status was granted by the Assembly to the Parliament of Kyrgyz Republic. The Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights fully supports the proposed draft uh, resolution. It also fully agrees with the Committee on Political Affairs that the Parliamentary Assembly's partnership with the Parliament of Kyrgyzstan has produced mixed results. As a general matter, granting the Partner for Democracy status to the Parliament of Kyrgyzstan should entail close cooperation with the Council of Europe, and this cooperation has not been very strong in the past few years. In particular, the Kyrgyz Republic has not acceded to any Council of Europe conventions or partial agreement, and the constitutional reform launched in 2020 has produced controversial results and put at risk the country's institutional balance, as stressed in particular in the joint opinion of the Venice Commission and OSCE ODIR of March 2021. Moreover, the human rights situation in Kyrgyzstan has not improved much since 2014, when the Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights examined it in its opinion on the report of the Committee on Political Affairs on the Kyrgyz Parliament's request for partner for democracy status. Although the report by Mr. Mayer rightly points out the increased number of threats and acts of intimidation towards human rights defenders and civil society, some other human rights issues should be pointed out too. They concern in particular law enforcement agents' impunity for acts of torture or ill treatment, poor detention conditions, lack of independence of the judiciary, issues with the right to be to a fair trial, enforced disappearances, 
problems with access to a lawyer while in detention and violations of the right to freedom of assembly. New concerns may also appear in relation with uh, controversial provisions of some recently amended or adopted laws, like the Code of Administrative Procedure, which now contains provisions on the prosecution of extremist individuals or organizations, the law on foreign agents, and the law on protection against false and inaccurate information. Thus, the Parliament of Kyrgyzstan should make more efforts to pursue its cooperation with the Council of Europe and should make it more concrete in order to further develop democracy, the rule of law, and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. It should regularly, preferably on an annual basis, inform the Assembly about the, about the state of progress in implementing Council of Europe principle. And in case there is no improved cooperation with the Assembly, the Assembly should consider suspending or even withdrawing partner for democracy status. And hence, the Committee on Legal Affairs has proposed some amendments to further strengthen the draft resolution regarding human rights experts and to stress the need for the Kyrgyz Parliament to be more proactive in fulfilling its obligation stemming from the Partner for Democracy status. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci à vous, cher Sergei, pour présenter l'avis de la Commission de, des questions juridiques et de, des droits de l'homme. Dans la discussion générale, la parole est maintenant à M. Ahmed Unal Sivikos euh, de la Turquie. Euh, il parle au nom du groupe socialiste euh, Vert et démocrate. Ahmed. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear colleagues, dear friends. Preparing this report must have been quite difficult. One certainly needs resilience to reflect appropriately what the Kyrgyz Republic aims at, what it is going through, and why it is important to keep this country engaged with the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Thanks to our reporter, we have a very accurate and informative report in front of us. First, I would like to share a personal experience with you, which I presume will help to understand why the Kyrgyz people need to be anchored with our organization. I first visited Bishkek, the capital of the Kyrgyz Republic, in 1993. It was after the disintegration of the former Soviet Union. I was surprised to see the statue of Lenin in a small square behind the building, which is known to be the History Museum today. I was surprised because many, if not almost all, statues of Lenin were destroyed in the former Soviet republics but it was still standing there in Bishkek. I asked why this was so. I was told that Kyrgyz people discussed the matter seriously and decided that the Soviet past was a part of their history, that they wouldn't rewrite history, and that they would show respect to their past no matter what their present is and what their future would be. This decision has never been contested in the last 30 years, and I think this is a very democratic stance. Eight years ago, when the Kyrgyz Republic made its official request to become a partner for democracy of the Council of Europe, they did not fail to declare that they shared the values upheld by our member states. It is true, however, that in the last eight years, the Kyrgyz Republic has not acceded to any Council of Europe conventions. It is true that the authorities of Kyrgyzstan have not taken account of the recommendations made by the Venice Commission. But it is also notable and remarkable to remember that Kyrgyzstan is the first, and as far as I know, till now, the only Central Asian country to apply for partner for democracy status with our assembly. It is the willingness and the intention that counts, and we have to take this into consideration. It's important to remember that this country has also abolished that penalty. It is particularly important to note that Kyrgyzstan is determined to defend the sovereignty of Ukraine and not to associate itself with Russian aggression. In fact, Kyrgyzstan advocates peaceful settlement of disputes between these two countries. Kyrgyzstan has gone through serious turmoil in the last couple of years. We do see the weaknesses and failings of their democratic institutions, but we also see that they strive to go along the path to democracy in spite of all those internal and external interventions. It is therefore necessary to keep them engaged, not to discourage and alienate them to our values, but to encourage them to continue their efforts to comply with the requirements of partnership with our assembly. And this report gives us the opportunity to offer this important chance 
to the Kyrgyz people. Let us support it. Thank you very much, Ahmed. And now I give the floor to uh, uh, Mr. Vladimir Vardanian from Armenia. He speaks on behalf of the European People's Party, and he is always standing already ready to take the floor. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is a really special place, and with a very good people, uh, very hospitable, and Kyrgyz Republic is one of the countries of the former Soviet Union and especially in Central Asia, which is try to be the most transparent, the most open as uh, it could be. I am saying this because the challenges and threats which met Kyrgyzstan during this last 30 years of independence were not the same as, for example, the threats for other countries. Kyrgyzstan uh, history and the uh, uh, level of engagement in the processes which actually have taken in the territory of the former Soviet Union uh, was really very interesting and important. For sure, I have seen even before joining this assembly the will, the great will of Kyrgyz people to share the European values. And the fact that we actually exceeded, not exceeded, but uh, implemented several reforms, in particular the abolition of death penalty and so on, is witnessing that we are trying to come closer to European values. Being far geographically, we are trying to be closer to the European values. But I would like just to say that for sure this is a very complicated road and we should provide the necessary conditions for bringing Kyrgyz Republic and Kyrgyz Parliament, Jogorgo Kanesh, closer to the, our values. But simultaneously, I should address to my Kyrgyz friends, Kyrgyz colleagues, saying that nothing is given as granted. If we are promise, and I know what does it mean, promise, in Kyrgyzstan, if you promise to undertake reforms, you should do this. Otherwise, this would be a very complicated role. I do believe, I am almost sure, that Kyrgyz authorities are really interested in further cooperation. And we somehow, together, should, by our joint efforts, do all the possible to in root European values in Kyrgyzstan. And our Kyrgyz colleagues should do all possible to be more active in this assembly. I do believe that their active participation in the work of our assembly would be a serious asset, not only for us, not only for uh, Kyrgyz Republic, but to all wide European region. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear Vladimir. Next in the debate, I call Mr. Bob van Pereire from the Netherlands, and he speaks on behalf of the European Conservatives. Bob, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The report and the opinion of the committee are clear. To get democracy is hard work. To keep it needs continuous energy. It is clear and well written that there is still a lot to do. A lot has to be improved to live up to the requirements of a democratic society. The committee has great hope in a newly elected parliament. We support their conclusions in this. We encourage Kyrgyzstan to take the lead to change. We understand that for them a lot of steps has to be made. The committee is in favor of your expected initiatives, we learn. Kyrgyzstan, take this chance. For the benefit of your people, share the great family of the Council of Europe, and most welcome when you are ready. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you well, uh, Bob. Uh, next in the debate, I call Mr. Rafael Husseinov from Azerbaijan, and he represents uh, the, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats in Europe. Rafael, Thank you, Mr. President, dear colleagues. First of all, 
On behalf of ILD Group, I would like to start by thanking the reporter, Mr. Mayor, for this very important report. The Council of Europe has long ago overstepped the limit of being a purely European organization. For several years, a number of non-European countries have been directly participating in the meetings of the Assembly and actively cooperating with the Council of Europe. From this point of view, just as close cooperation with us is beneficial for the Kyrgyz Republic, which received the status of a partner for democracy with the Assembly eight years ago, it is equally important for us to have systematic relations with the country, one of the newly independent states in Central Asia apparently outside our geography. Because we are talking about establishing a network of values such as human rights, democracy, the rule of law in a wider area of contact. We have been closely following the change that have happened in the Kyrgyz Republic in recent years and the complex developments that have taken place. Uh, and we have witnessed the political concerns also that has occurred since the 2020 elections. Of course, all this could not but have a negative impact on the normal development of relations. Notwithstanding, Kyrgyzstan has made commitments in the eight years since it received the status of partner for democracy with the Assembly, it has not yet acceded to any convention. Nevertheless, we must evaluate this not as a divergence of our parts, but as a consequence of the current historical circumstances. Today, the country must do a lot to ensure the adequate formation of democratic institutions, and this situation should not generate any hesitation in the Council of Europe. On the contrary, it is the Council of Europe that can give more attention and support to the Kyrgyz Republic in this direction, and its efforts in this direction should not be spared. To do this, it is necessary to continue cooperation and partnership more consistently. In fact, Kyrgyzstan itself has a strong desire to benefit more from the Council of Europe. To realize the intentions, it is necessary to create more favorable conditions for Kyrgyzstan to involve it more closely in the work of the Council of Europe, in the activities of the committees, through intensive contacts. Dear colleagues, Jagorko Kenesh, this is the name of the Kyrgyz parliament. Kenesh is one of the oldest Turkic words signifying council, meeting. And Kyrgyzstan is the sole Turkic state whose parliament is expressed poorly in ancient national words. That is the propensity for discussion, advice, exchange of opinions is one of the most stable qualities of these people since ancient times. We would like to believe and hope that the reporters on Kyrgyzstan, unlike the preceded us, uh, will make the reports with more successful outcomes and contribute to the progress of Kyrgyzstan Council of Europe relations and democratic partnership in the desired direction. Thank you. Thank you, dear Rafael. Now, last speaker on, in the, uh, on behalf of the political uh, groups is Mr. Bjarni Jonsson from Iceland, and he represents the position of the unified European left. Bjarni, you have the floor. Mr. President, to begin with, I want to thank the Rapporteur for a sharp review of the development and progress of the partnership for democracy between the Parliament of the Kyrgyz Republic and our Assembly. The report reflects on many challenges the partnership was meant to navigate through in order to strengthen especially the foundations of democratic rights and security. Before being granted the status of partner for democracy, the Kyrgyz Republic declared that it shared the values upheld by the Council of Europe. However, as it appears eight years later, sadly, the partnership appears to have produced mixed results. We have to take notice of alarming reports from uh, Kyrgyz civil society about violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms, especially those that relate to gender issues, the practice of torture, and the respect for important fundamental freedoms, <coughs> such as uh, freedom of expression. Further, it is also worrisome to learn about the legislative steps taken re recently to allow for the prosecution of organizational or individuals considered extremists. As noted by observers, this legislation poses a threat to civil society, actors, and political opposition groups. I would like to note that similar laws have been used in the in Council of Europe member states to hinder the work of the opposition and emphasize that it is the duty of the Council of Europe to take swift action 
to counter such developments wherever they occur. According to the report, the recent changes made to the electoral legislation in Kyrgyzstan deprived a large proportion of the population of the right to stand for elections to the parliament. This especially affected women, young people, and those that have not completed higher education. I would like to echo the rapporteur's call to strengthen the efforts of the Kyrgyz government to promote women's participation in politics and public affairs, combat all forms of gender-based discrimination, ensure effective equality between women and men, and combat violence against women. Despite the Kyrgyz Republic currently falling short of upholding some important pillars of the partnership, there have been positive developments in fundamental areas, such as the abolition of the death penalty and signs of further improvements. In conclusion, it is important for the partnership to proceed in a productive manner, and I hope the Kyrgyzstan authorities sign and ratify Council of Europe conventions and partial agreements open to non-member states, especially those relating to human rights, the rule of law and democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. And now we continue with the rest of the list of speakers. And first, I give the floor to Madam Marina Berenguere from Italy. Marina, you have the floor. A posto? Giusto. Grazie, scusate. <ride> e, caro Presidente, gentili colleghi, il, la relazione chiarisce perfettamente il fatto che questo partenariato ha prodotto luce e ombre. Da un lato non ci sono stati grandi e significativi progressi nella ratifica da parte del Kyrgyzstan degli strumenti del Consiglio d'Europa e neanche eh, della, delle indicazioni della Commissione di Venezia. Dall'altro lato però abbiamo raccolto eh, il desiderio di continuare questo partenariato di cooperazione sia dalle istituzioni che anche dalla società civile che durante la miss le missioni di osservazione delle elezioni noi abbiamo potuto vedere essere molto propositiva e anche eh, molto, molto viva. Infine la posizione del Kyrgyzstan sull'attuale drammatica situazione eh, internazionale anche in considerazione della sua collocazione geografica ci eh, fa dire che è una posizione davvero molto coraggiosa. Ecco, proprio questa situazione eh, così difficile che stiamo vivendo ci fa riflettere su quanto ci sia bisogno di tutelare, rafforzare la democrazia in uno spirito di dialogo, di rispetto, anche di pazienza eh, per i tempi che richiedono le differenze contingenti che esistono tra i diversi paesi e di come anche il compito della nostra istituzione possa essere fondamentale, anche dove il percorso verso la democrazia eh, è a rischio di regressioni o anche addirittura di essere abbandonato. Io sono quindi pienamente d'accordo con la proposta del relatore che intende proseguire il partenariato a supporto e a incoraggiamento di coloro che in Kyrgyzstan con modi diversi e mo con modalità differenti stanno lavorando con fatica affinché la democrazia, lo stato di diritto e il rispetto dei diritti umani possano essere a fondamento della vita sociale e istituzionale. Ecco, io penso che non vi sia un'istituzione più adatta del Consiglio d'Europa a svolgere un ruolo così importante in un momento in cui tutti ci stiamo rendendo conto di quanto la democrazia vada sempre eh, difesa e rafforzata. Grazie. Thank you very much, uh, dear Marina. Next in the debate I call Mr. Attila Tilki from, uh, uh, from Turkey. Attila, you have the floor. From Hungary. I said something completely wrong, so you didn't hear that, Attila. Of course, I said Mr. Attila Tilki from Hungary. <laughs> yeah, thank you. My name is Turkish. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, despite the significant geographic distance between our region, Hungary considers the countries of Central Asia as important partners. We are striving for extensive and multifaceted relationship with the countries of Central Asia region, particularly in areas of economic and trade cooperation. The development of Hungary's eastern relations is a priority of our foreign policy. Central Asia is one of the largest, one of the target uh, regions of this policy. This is based on the principle that the stability 
of the Central Asia is utmost importance not only for the region itself, but for Europe as well. Hungary is committed to international development support for the Kyrgyz Republic, especially in areas where our country has competitive knowledge, significant experience and high-quality technologies. Hungary welcomes and supports the Kyrgyz Republic efforts to build relations with European countries. Therefore, we are pleased that the country is developing its cooperation with the Council of Europe. We hope that the partnership between the Council of Europe and the Kyrgyz Parliament will be effective and successful. Hungary is ready to deepen further its political economic relationship with Kyrgyzstan. For this reason, we have taken our bilateral state relations to a new level by signing the Hungary and Kyrgyz strategic partnership declaration. We uh, welcome the opening of Embassy of the Kyrgyz Republic in Budapest on the 4th of October last year, creating new opportunities for cooperation. From October uh, last year, the Hungarian Embassy in Bishkek has begun issuing visas which help the promotion of relations and mobility. And, uh, of course, uh, we have to speak about that. Uh, our diplomatic relationship uh, between Hungary and Kyrgyzstan is 30 years uh, this year. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, dear Attila. And once again, for the record, Attila is from the beautiful country of Hungary. <laughs> from the beautiful country of Turkey is um, uh, Madam Azu Erdem, and she now gets the floor. Thank you very much, dear President, dear colleagues. First of all, I want to thank the Rapporteur for the preparation of this important report. It should have been underlined that Kyrgyzstan, as the most democratic country in the Central Asia despite having some shortcomings, is an important partner for us, the Council of Europe, and other Western-based international organizations. By establishing close cooperation with these international organizations, Kyrgyzstan has achieved significant progress and shown willingness and commitments, commitment to strengthen democracy in the past. However, the last couple of years were challenging for Kyrgyzstan. Political turmoil after violent demonstrations started in October 2020 led to serious instability in the country and distribution disrupted the normal functioning of democratic institutions and processes. Nevertheless, this instability has been overcome to some degree in the short term. Also, many problems addressed by the Council of Europe as well as other organizations, international organizations in the past are unresolved, and Kyrgyzstan still has a long way to go towards democracy and the rule of law. If we look at the long term, we should see that it has achieved significant pro pro progress. I think that it is more important to discuss, as, as the Council of Europe, how we approach the country with has partner for democracy status in Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Therefore, we should continue our support to Kyrgyzstan and follow closely the steps and, uh, that uh, would be undertaken by this country to fulfill its, its commitments. We need to bear in mind that Kyrgyzstan has important democratic experience and a vibrant civil society. In addition, cooperation of Kyrgyzstan with the Council of Europe, especially through the Venice Commission, has produced positive results in the past. So I believe that we should maintain our sincere cooperation and aid to this country. In order to increase our impact, I believe that it is important to work closely, closely with other international partners, such as Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, to strengthen our effort to support demo democratic developments, not just in Kyrgyzstan, but also other countries in the region. At least I send my greetings from Turkey to friendly and brotherly country, Kyrgyzstan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Asu. And now, last but not least, speaker on my list is Mr. Baki Tentishev from Kyrgyzstan. You have the floor, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, and participants of the session. On behalf of the Gurkhu Kenesh of the Kyrgyz Republic, I would like to express our gratitude to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe for the invitation to participate and be present in the summer session. As you know, in 2014, Gurkhu Kenesh of the Kyrgyz Republic was granted the status of Partner for Democracy. We highly value and cherish the status. The experience and knowledge gained over these years have significantly increased the potential of the institution of parliamentarism in the country and strengthened us advocating to common values, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Let me emphasize that such problem as corruption, failure to respect human rights and freedom, as well as stagnation of democratic processes are common challenges for all the Council of Europe member states. It is possible to cope with them only by joining the efforts. In the fight against corruption, the work continues to fully study the possible accession of, of the Kyrgyz Republic to the group of states against corruption. The freedom of the media in Kyrgyzstan is a matter of special pride of the country. There are no obstacles to their free registration and function and there is no state censorship. In 2021, according to the freedom of speech rating of the International Organization Reporters Without Borders, Kyrgyzstan ranked 79th out of 115 countries and improved its rating by 19 points compared to 2018. We also continue to work towards accession to the Council of Europe's Open Conventions. We are currently party to the Lisbon Convention of 11 April 1997 on the recognition of qualifications concerning higher education in the European region. The Kyrgyz Republic has also submitted an application for accession to the Council of Europe Convention of the Transfer of Convicted Persons of March 21, 1983. The committees of ministers of the Council of Europe have considered the application of the Kyrgyz side made a positive decision and invited the Kyrgyz Republic to join this convention. We are also consulting with the Council of Europe with a view to acceding to the 1957 Council of Europe conventions on extradition and on mutual legal assistance in criminal matters of 1959. The Kyrgyz Republic successfully cooperates with the Council of Europe in the framework of the rule of law program in Central Asia. We believe that that through this program, we will be able to improve the life of our citizens and bring the basic indicators of human rights and the rule of law up to European and international standards. Taking all this into account, the Kyrgyz Republic is based primarily on democratic principles, and we consider it mutually interesting for our future cooperation within the framework of the status of partner for democracy of the Council of Europe for the subsequent development of democracy, the rule of law, the fight against corruption, as well as protection of human rights and fundamental freedom in Kyrgyzstan. Once again, thank you all for the warm welcome, for the time provided, and for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, dear Bakit, for your contribution. And with the contribution of Monsieur Tantisiev de la Kyrgyzstan, La, la, la liste des orateurs est épuisée. J'appelle la réplique de la Commission. Monsieur le maire, vous avez cinq minutes pour répondre aux intervenants. Je vais faire durer ma voix cinq minutes. <rire> Ça va être difficile. Euh, D'abord, merci pour cet excellent débat aux différents orateurs de groupe. Je pense que, et aux orateurs, je pense qu'il y a une, une bienveillance, une disponibilité une attention portée par tout le monde qui est effectivement un signe positif et un message d'espoir que vous, euh, Monsieur Tentichef, pourront rapporter à Bishkek. Euh, c'est vrai, comme l'a dit Monsieur Vikos, que j'ai vu, moi, ces statues de Lénine qui n'ont pas été effectivement mises à bas. Euh, c'est un des rares pays, c'est vrai, qui a une forme de, de tolérance à la diversité des opinions. C'est un pays qui est divers, y compris dans ses, dans ses aspirations et dans sa population. Et cette capacité de vivre ensemble de façon non pas calme, mais un peu gauloise, je dirais un peu à la française, avec beaucoup de débats et d'affrontements, 
et quelque chose qui, qui, qui nous relie depuis Paris jusqu'à Bishkek. Et c'est vrai que de ce point de vue, il est difficile pour nous de juger non pas de l'intention, mais de la crédibilité des engagements. C'est un moment un petit peu solennel, mais quand on regarde à la fois le gouvernement et le Parlement, il y a à la fois des acteurs de progrès pro-européens et très engagés, et puis il y a aussi des acteurs qui sont plutôt dans un jeu négatif, dans un jeu de blocage et dans un lieu de frein. Et ces acteurs de progrès, ces acteurs de, de rapprochement nous disent « aidez-nous à gagner la bataille ». Mais cette bataille, elle n'est pas certaine, l'issue n'est pas là. <coughs> J'ai un, un sentiment par rapport à cela. Mon sentiment, c'est que nous avons un défi qui est très particulier. Nous avons un, un pays qui est pauvre, donc le Parlement est pauvre, dont les moyens opérationnels pour venir ici à Strasbourg sont limités. Et bien sûr, un partenariat, c'est 50% du chemin fait par chacun, je pense que si nous ne faisons pas un peu plus de ce chemin par rapport à d'autres, euh, pour faire en sorte que le Kyrgyzstan puisse exploiter cette relation, nous aurons des difficultés. Euh, parmi les, les sujets peut-être à aborder, il y en a deux que j'aborde, euh, faut-il ou pas, et apparemment ce serait possible, que des acteurs de financement internationaux du Kyrgyzstan investissent dans la coopération entre le Kyrgyzstan et le Conseil de l'Europe Ça m'a semblé possible, moi, à Bishkek, ça intéresse des organisations d'aider le Kyrgyzstan à travailler avec nous, encore faut-il que nous nous en occupions. Deuxième élément, il y a effectivement un rapport de suivi à, enfin, un élément de, un suivi à faire. Je pense que si nous n'avons pas de dispositif dans les deux ans qui viennent pour assurer une continuité de la relation, il est probable que les mêmes causes, l'éloignement, la difficulté, le manque de moyens, produisent un peu les mêmes effets. Et donc moi, j'en appelle à la fois à la Commission, cher Georges, et aussi à vous, Monsieur le Président Chertini, euh, d'imaginer pour ces partenariats un peu spécifiques comment on peut faire en sorte que, au sein de l'Assemblée, quelqu'un soit particulièrement mobilisé pour animer ce dialogue dans les deux ans qui viennent et pour maintenir cette relation de façon à ce qu'il y ait des évolutions positives. Vis-à-vis -vis de cela, on a entendu des choses très intéressantes euh, de la part de M. Tentichev. Je voudrais les, les, les réaffirmer, enfin les, les, les réinterpréter. Évidemment, une volonté. Des résultats du point de vue, euh, Mme Balingiri l'a dit, de l'efficacité du processus électoral, même s'il y a des contestations possibles. Des résultats du point de vue de la démocratie, de la société civile. Et le fait que cette, con cette constitution assez brutale, est interprété en réalité de manière assez libérale. Donc ce sont quand même des points qui, qui sont à constater. Et puis j'ai entendu une forme d'ouverture, mais qui de, moi, de mon point de vue n'est pas tout à fait suffisante. C'est-à-dire que quand on écoute ce que sont les conventions sur lesquelles M. Tentichev a dit que la, le Kyrgyzstan était prêt à, à s'ouvrir et, et, et était prêt à considérer la reconnaissance des diplômes, le transfert des prisonniers, la convention sur les extraditions, c'est parfait, c'est intéressant. Mais ce sont des outils administratifs, opérationnels, qui visent à faciliter la coopération entre États. Ce ne sont pas encore aujourd'hui des instruments protecteurs des droits de l'homme et des citoyens kirghiz. Et de ce point de vue, je, un seul exemple, mais au moment où nous nous battons tous collectivement pour faire en sorte que les violences domestiques soient un élément marqueur de notre visibilité, le fait d'avoir un pays d'Asie centrale, par exemple, un pays musulman, qui soit dans une démarche de ratification de la Convention d'Istanbul, serait un message politique extrêmement important. Et dans ces cas-là, si effectivement nous sommes importants pour le Kyrgyzstan, le Kyrgyzstan serait important pour le Conseil de l'Europe. En conclusion, je voudrais dire évidemment merci pour l'accueil que nous avons reçu chez les collègues, chez les collègues à Bishkek. Merci évidemment à mon partenaire de jeu, qui m'a permis, cher Pavel, d'être, je dirais, guidé dans ces dédales de Bishkek qui ne sont pas très simples. Et puis merci à tous parce que ceci est ma dernière intervention. Je suis content de la faire sur ce sujet. Merci. Merci à vous, Jacques. I will say some words at the real end of this, uh, uh, this discussion, but we still have work to do. But indeed, we, we took notice of the fact that this might be your last debate, so we will come back to that issue later. Uh, 
Euh, monsieur Georges Catrougalos, euh, désire-t-il répondre au nom de la Commission des Affaires Politiques Georges, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I would like to thank Zach for an impressive uh, work, a thorough report. He has managed to deliver, whereas his predecessors did not make it. I would like also to thank uh, Mr. Kaltsenko for his contribution through the legal committee. And uh, uh, I am especially uh, glad that we had also the chance to hear the views from Kyrgyzstan by uh, a member of the parliament there. And I think that uh, Zach has made clear the situation. There is political will, there are aspirations on behalf of uh, the Kyrgyz government in order to progress democratically, to uh, be part of this common European legal space for freedoms and rights. But uh, uh, despite these aspirations, the results are mixed. I think the best indication for that is uh, uh, that uh, the country has not yet acceded in a number of uh, conventions of the Council of Europe. And uh, uh, although it is very positive that we heard, as already the rapporteur has uh, uh, remarked, that there is an intention to join some of them, they have uh, more or less administrative character. They are not uh, of the core, uh, let's say, conventions that uh, really have a function of protection. But uh, I think that we should not uh, just uh, ignore other positive issues. It seems that uh, uh, the visit of our rapporteur there in March has given an additional motivation to the country to make uh, additional efforts. I think that uh, uh, there is a clear indication of more interest on behalf of the authorities to um, materialize their aspirations. And I believe that the new parliament elected in 2021 is going to be more efficient uh, towards uh, this road. The committee has unanimously uh, accepted uh, the report and also the proposal by uh, the rapporteur that uh, uh, we should continue the partnership while at the same time maintaining a rigorous dialogue with a new review to be conducted in uh, two years' time. And, uh, of course, in our meeting earlier, uh, we took position in favor of most amendments proposed from, uh, uh, by the coll our colleagues from the Legal Affairs Committee. Therefore, dear colleagues, I strongly encourage you to support this report. And uh, finally, since uh, it could be the last presence in uh, the hemicycle of uh, my friend and colleague, Zach, I would like, on behalf of all of you, to thank you for the important contribution. And I'm sure that we are going to find each other soon or later in the same path of defense of basic human values, freedoms, what is the fundament of the Council of Europe. Merci, Sir Jacques. Thank you very much, uh, George. The Committee on Political Affairs and Democracy has presented the draft resolution which you find in document 15526, to which nine amendments and, and a sub-amendment have been tabled. Amendments will be taken in the order in which they appear in the compendium. I remind you that speeches on amendment are limited to 30 seconds. I understand that the chairperson uh, the representative of the chairperson of the Committee on Political Affairs and Democracy wishes to propose to the Assembly that amendments 1, 2, 5, 7 and 8 to the draft resolution, which were unanimously approved by the Committee, should be declared as agreed by the Assembly. I also understand that amendment 6 was unanimously agreed by the Committee, but it must be taken individually with the tabled sub-amendment. Is that so, Mr. Katrugalos? It is so, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Does anybody object? 
I do, do not see objections. Therefore, I declare that amendments one, two, five, seven, and eight to the draft resolution have been agreed. That's right. Any amendment which has been rejected by the committee, seized for report by two thirds majority of the vote, shall uh, votes cast shall not be put to the vote in the plenary and shall be declared as de definitely rejected unless 10 of more members of the assembly object. I understand that the, chair, the representative of the chairperson of the committee wishes to propose to the assembly that amendments 3, 4 and 9 to the draft resolution, which were rejected by the committee with a two-thirds majority, be declared as rejected. Is that so, Mr. Katrugalas? This is exact, uh, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Does anybody object? I do not see so, as there is no objection, I declare the amendments 3, 4 and 9 to the draft resolution rejected. Uh, Mr. Chair, there is somebody. Oh. Madam Zensva, you do object. Well, I, I think Mr. Kalchenka, who was preparing the opinion for the resolution, was online, so he should have done it. But I assume he's not online right now. Sorry, he is online, so I... Um, oh, yes. Perhaps if, I over... Dear President, if it's possible, yeah, he, I, will, he will do it instead of me. I, 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 will, give, I will give the floor uh, to, uh, uh, to the rapporteur. The question is, did you try, did, did you object that we, so, one, one, one second, one second, we do not hear, we do not hear you. Do you hear me? Now we hear you. The question is, do you, uh, uh, do you, uh, do you object to the fact that the amendments 3, 4 and 9 to the draft resolution, which were rejected by the committee with a two-thirds majority, be declared as rejected, or do you agree with the decision of the committee? Well, I w I I'm ready to agree upon the issue of amendments 3 and 9, but I would like the Assembly to uh, consider and probably to adopt amendment number 4, at least. Okay, amendment number four, it's, uh, uh, there is an objection. I remind the assembly that the objection must be supported by at least 10 members. Will those who support this objection uh, to indicate their support by standing, 10 or more? I see. I see a lot of important people, but altogether they do not make uh, 10, including uh, the, 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 the Committee on Legal Affairs. So, sorry, uh, we uh, now declare that the amendments have been uh, rejected. There was some bookkeeping uh, to do over uh, over here. Excuse, uh, ex uh, please excuse me. I now call uh, Mr. Kalchenko to support Amendment Number Six on behalf of the Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights. Mr. Kalchenko, you have 30 seconds. Yes, uh, this amendment aims at specifying that the cooperation with the Venice Commission, in particular, sh should focus not only on laws but also on constitutional provisions. It also adds a reference to the joint opinion of the Venice Commission OSCE ODIR on the draft constitution that was further uh, uh, adopted, entered the legal force, and became a new uh, version of the constitution. Uh, I, I would say that uh, during the meeting of the committee, Mr. Mayor suggested a sub-amendment that I agree upon this sub-amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalshenko. I call Mr. Mayor on behalf of the Committee on Political Affairs and Democracy to support the sub-amendment, and you have 30 seconds. Oui, c'est simplement le fait d'insister sur le renforcement de la coopération avec la Commission de Venise afin de rapprocher non pas la Constitution, 
Donc le, le sub-amendment, c'est de supprimer le mot « la constitution » et de continuer, donc de rapprocher la législation des pays, des normes internationales, et à mettre en œuvre les recommandations antérieures, notamment en matière électorale, et celles qui figurent dans l'avis conjoint sur le projet de constitution de la République kirghize. Donc on prend l'amendement et on supprime simplement le mot « la constitution ». La région est très simple. La constitution a été adoptée récemment. Ce pas, ça n'a pas de sens de mettre une pression pour faire changer une constitution qui vient d'être adoptée dans les deux ans qui viennent, alors que les demandes sont extrêmement nombreuses sur beaucoup d'autres sujets. Merci, M. le maire. Je comprends que le the mover de l'amendement a accepté le sub-amendement, donc je vais maintenant le sub-amendement au vote. Le vote est ouvert. The vote is closed. I call for the results to be displayed. The sub-amendment is agreed to. We will now consider the main amendment as amended. Does anybody wish to speak against the amendment as amended? That is not the case. What is the opinion of the Committee on Legal Affairs and Democracy on the amendment as amended? Mr. Kalsenko. Yes, I support the, the uh, sub-amendments. I shall now put the amendment uh, as amended to the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the results to be displayed. The amendment is carried. We will now vote, we will now proceed to vote on the draft resolution contained in document 15526 as amended. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the results to be displayed. The resolution is adopted unanimously. Thank you very much. Congratulations to the rapporteur. This is the end of a debate, but it is also the end of an era as the era Jacques Maire uh, has now finished, although he is still available in our assembly. This was his last, uh, last report in, uh, in our assembly, the last of many of the reports that he uh, developed on, 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 behalf and, uh, on, uh, for, on behalf of our assembly and the committees in which he participated. Uh, Jacques, you were, you decided not to run in the last elections. Um, that was your decision. You did not ask for an opinion of any committee. You decided it for yourself. If you would have asked the opinion of the president, he would have said, run, Jack, run, and not run away from the, from, uh, from the assembly, but stay here. You have shown, and this I really mean, you have shown to be an excellent colleague in this uh, assembly. You were often uh, characterized as a, a diplomat. And nothing wrong with a good diplomat, is what I always uh, say. Uh, you have to be in an, in an assembly that calls itself a meeting place, an agora for parliamentary diplomacy. You have to be, at least once in a while, a diplomat. As a president now, and as a colleague in the presidential committee for years, I can say that your diplomatic solutions helped our assembly a lot to take the right decisions and not to enter into uh, uh, fruitless debates, which are also always available uh, and can all, always have uh, been taken up. You 
uh, were there on crucial moments when we had to take decisions in this assembly. You were there uh, representing your group, the group that you led, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats in, in, in Europe, in a, in a, in a very uh, in an excellent way. And I see that Julian is sitting behind. Yes, in an excellent way. So Julian, <laughs> it will not be easy to step in the shoes of, uh, of, of Jacques. Uh, you were uh, playing an important role as a member of the assembly, as a rapporteur, as the chairperson of the, the, uh, the group of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats, and as a, a, a very much experienced member of the presidential committee. Some call it the Politburo of the organization. I would prefer to call it, as it is named, the presidential committee. There you played an enormous, important role. And you appeared to be uh, a good friend as well. And I thank you for all of that. Uh, being a good friend, being a good uh, colleague in the presidential committee, being an excellent rapporteur, being an excellent leader of the ALDE group, and being a great colleague in this, uh, this assembly. So I would like to ask everybody not to take the floor uh, by, uh, by using your microphone, but just using your hands and give Jack a big applause. Thank you, thank you very much. We now come to the debate on the, the report titled The Control of Online Communication, a Threat to Media Pluralism, Freedom and Information and Human Dignity. His document 15537, presented by Mr. Frederick Rice on behalf of the Committee of, on Culture, Science, Education and Media. In order to finish by 8 p.m., I will in interrupt the list of speakers at about 7.45 p.m. to allow time for the reply and the vote on the draft resolution. I call Mr. Rice, rapporteur, to take the floor. You have seven minutes, sir. Merci, Madame la Présidente. J'ai ici le, le, le badge de Jacques Maire, si, si quelqu'un peut lui dire. Petite annonce pour commencer. Voilà, chers collègues, au terme d'un long travail, nous arrivons ce soir à la présentation d'un projet de résolution sur un thème d'une actualité criante. Faut-il un contrôle de la communication en ligne Si oui, ce contrôle peut-il devenir une menace pour le pluralisme des médias la liberté d'information et la dignité humaine. J'ai pris le train en marche puisque le premier rapporteur était Soch Avanissian de l'Arménie et je voudrais le remercier pour le travail initial. Le projet de résolution tient compte des remarques que les experts que nous avons rencontrés lors d'une réunion à Paris, de même que j'ai tenu compte des prises de position de la Commission européenne ainsi que des commentaires et des analyses des représentants de l'intergouvernemental du Conseil de l'Europe. 
Merci aux collègues qui ont apporté leur contribution lors de la réunion de Rome, de la Commission de la culture, de la science, de l'éducation et des médias. Et je salue le président qui est à côté de moi. Le texte qui a été adopté à l'unanimité à Rome a été pour la rédaction finale l'objet d'amendements concernant Wikileaks et son fondateur Julian Assange. C'est un aspect que nous n'avions pas mentionné dans le rapport. Il est vrai que l'objectif initial de Wikileaks allait dans le sens d'informations pluralistes et transparentes. Et nous savons que le fait de mieux prendre en compte les lanceurs d'alerte est une préoccupation actuelle de nos gouvernements respectifs. Nous aurons l'occasion d'en discuter après la discussion générale. Pour en venir sur le fond de ce rapport, il est une évidence aujourd'hui, le flux d'informations en ligne a augmenté de manière exponentielle et nul n'ignore l'importance de la communication en ligne aujourd'hui. Tout le monde veut faire connaître ou se faire connaître ce que les personnes engagées en politique savent bien. L'utilisation de l'intelligence artificielle et des filtres automatisés pour la modération des contenus n'est sans doute pas la panacée. L'intelligence artificielle a pris une part prépondérante dans le quotidien de nos sociétés, mais il faut faire preuve de discernement. Et comme l'ont fait remarquer certains membres de la Commission culture, il ne faut pas oublier la présence indispensable de décideurs humains. Nous souhaitons tous des politiques de communication ouvertes et transparentes, et nous ne pouvons que nous inquiéter de la concentration des flux d'informations en ligne chez une petite poignée d'intermédiaires d'Internet. Leur impact sur les droits de l'homme, la démocratie et l'état de droit, en effet, nous interpelle. Intermédiaire d'Internet était longtemps une notion un peu fourre-tout, mais aujourd'hui, le Conseil de l'Europe a défini précisément ces prestataires de services qui facilitent les interactions entre les personnes physiques et les personnes morales. On constate aujourd'hui que des sociétés privées de l'Internet ont un pouvoir démesuré dans le domaine économique et technologique et peuvent ainsi influer sur presque tous les aspects de la vie privée et sociale des gens. Alors qu'on les interpelle, ces oligopoles disent garantir la diversité des sources d'informations ainsi que le pluralisme des idées et opinions en ligne en faisant appel à l'intelligence artificielle que j'ai déjà mentionnée. Et il faut en souligner les limites. Il y a l'émergence d'un pouvoir politique non démocratique et en effet, lorsque la communication électorale, par exemple, se déplace vers la sphère numérique, celui qui arrive à la contrôler peut devenir, notamment pendant les campagnes électorales, une force politique redoutable. En France, les éléments de documentation de propagande électorale ont toujours existé, c'était des tracts par papier souvent, mais une propagande sur le net est évidemment beaucoup plus violente et peut véhiculer parfois des informations trompeuses, manipulatrices et ainsi peser sur le résultat d'un scrutin. Au moment où ce rapport a été élaboré, nous ignorions que la Fédération de Russie allait envahir l'Ukraine le 24 février 2022. Mais il est sûr qu'en temps de guerre, la désinformation ou la non-information des populations peut être à l'origine de comportements coupables qui mettent en danger des vies humaines parfois même, et c'est même une certitude, provoque des morts, y compris dans les populations civiles. Je tenais à le préciser en marge de ce rapport. Nous souhaitons tous des informations variées et de qualité, ainsi qu'une pluralité des sources, des sources disponibles en ligne. Les systèmes algorithmiques sont évidemment très utiles, avec la quantité phénoménale des informations qui circulent. Mais attention à leur utilisation abusive, voire malhonnête, pour façonner des informations, des connaissances, des opinions ou même des émotions. Alors permettez-moi d'insister sur la ligne A7 du projet de résolution qui dit « Avec l'émergence des intermédiaires d'Internet, les contenus préjudiciables se propagent à très grande vitesse sur la toile. Les intermédiaires d'Internet devraient être particulièrement attentifs à leur devoir de diligence lorsqu'ils produisent ou gèrent des contenus disponibles sur leur plateforme ou lorsqu'ils jouent un rôle de conservateur ou d'éditeur tout en évitant de supprimer les contenus de tiers, à l'exception évidemment des contenus clairement illégaux. Enfin, pour terminer, je voudrais évoquer la tendance à la réglementation des plateformes des médias sociaux avec parfois la mise en danger de la liberté d'expression. 
Il peut en effet y avoir des effets pervers, et c'est d'ailleurs l'objet de la ligne 10 du projet de résolution. Si les législateurs choisissent d'imposer des réglementations trop strictes à tous les intermédiaires d'Internet, y compris les nouvelles petites entreprises en train de s'installer, cela pourrait consolider en fait la position des grands acteurs qui sont déjà sur le marché et ce n'est évidemment pas le but recherché. Or, pour éviter des situations archi-dominantes, de nouveaux acteurs seraient bienvenus. En conséquence, il est recommandé d'adopter une approche progressive pour adapter différents types de réglementation aux différents types de plateformes et c'est ce que je propose dans ce projet de résolution. Je vous remercie. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rice. Uh, and uh, now uh, we, we continue on the debate, the speakers on behalf of the political groups. And uh, first, I call Yuri, Mr. Yuri Kamelchuk from the EPP group uh, Ukraine uh, online, but uh, I'm not sure. No? Then we continue. And uh, the next one is Mrs. Nigar Arpadaria uh, from Azerbaijan and European Conservatives. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Today, control over online communication literally means power. Never in the history of humankind was there, any, was there such an efficient way to influence people's behavior, often without their knowledge. It is by all means a scary prospect. Even scarier is the fact that there is no real accountability mechanism for either social media captains, governments of sec or security services when they introduce online control or manipulation mechanisms. There are currently few obvious trends in internet. First one is economic. Large corporations, owners of social media and producers of gadgets and apps create software and hardware tools of dual usage. On the one hand, the microphone in your phone helps you to talk to friends. On the other, it writes down your behavior patterns and turns them into your profile, which belongs not to you, but to corporations. S through this profile, the corporations know your preferences and motifs, and they do not only offer your things to buy, but they rather nudge you into buying them. They use your weaknesses in order to obtain profit. Well, this is how advertising works throughout history. This is not news, but today there is no real regulation on this. Regulators are far behind markets. They don't even understand what happens online. Infringements to rights of people, manipulation, corporate greed are online realities. Another trend in business is that these realities, describe, these realities lead to monopolization. Large social media owners with access to mass personal data acquire unreasonable advantage over small businesses who has no access to it. Large corporations become larger, small businesses suffer from aggressive interruption by large companies. And we are not talking decades, this is happening now. Another and even more troublesome trend is the comfortable silence of large countries' security services about what they, what they actually do online. The current architecture of Internet gives them unchecked and unlimited influence. It is the influence over both persons across the globe, regardless of their location or nationality, and it is the influence over the small countries and nations, which do not have the privilege of having special relations with social media owners. Any statement that social media is pure business and entertainment are utter nonsense. They are weapon. The lack, total lack of accountability of what the large countries do in the Internet is a dangerous situation and it will lead to explosive consequences sooner or later. They will eventually undermine smaller nations in their sovereignty. They will interfere in domestic politics, even for a noble cause. We here in Council of Europe, the oldest and the most notorious human rights organization in the world, must reform ourselves in order to adapt to this massive challenge. We are not really fit to this discussion yet, and we need to review the mission and plans of the organization. Unfortunately, free internet became the internet where rich and powerful abuse small and poor. And this inadvertently leads to violation of human rights, a core mission for this organization. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And then we continue to uh, the ALDE, on behalf of the ALDE group, and that's Mr. Zeki Hakan Sidali from Turkey. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. I would like to thank <coughs> the rapporteur for this detailed and comprehensive work. 
It's a quite difficult job to write a report which stands for freedom of speech and at the same time discusses to control misuse of this in regard to misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and to draw the correct line in between. An independent and pluralistic media environment is utmost important to our democracies. Press, radio, and TV ages had their different models and clearly defined own information sources. But in digital age, traditional media has expanded with online media and social media. That improved freedom of speech and personal participation in a good manner. But at the same time, misuse of that freedom increased as never before. So what should we do? Should we give up our freedom of choice and hand in ourselves to artificial intelligence or to the mercy of control freak governments? The intermediary companies gained enormous power and created trade barriers as never before. Their priorities and benefits do not match with the platform's users. They are often foreseeable users whom they can manipulate according to their preferences. Due to own AI programs, they claim to know us better than ourselves. They share information they think fit for each of us. In time, this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Given regularly selected information by AI, step by step, user becomes the person AI wants them to be. Slightly, artificial intelligence turns us to artificial people. That's not acceptable. We need a more transparent control mechanism and preferably by third party fact checking networks, which should ensure us our right to choose our own information flood. Another issue is control free government. They should never become a virtual big brother. As the number of illiberal democracies increase, number of governments using regulations as a stick also rise. Laws should avoid broad concepts that are open to interpretation, such as harmful content. Laws should not be implemented within a biased interpretation. We cannot be on the side of the ban. We cannot give up our free media or freedom of speech. And we cannot correct a mistake with another one. We know the cost of this very well. What we need is, instead of less transparent and controlled information by somebody, more information, more transparency, and more inclusivity by everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sidali. And uh, on behalf of the United Left, uh, Mr. Alexandros Trianta Filidis. Yes, yes. Yes. yes, from Greece. The floor is yours. Kyrias ke kyrie sinadrefi. Tha ithela prin na tropopiiso na emblutiso ton to thema to logio, ya na imaste pio kodas afto po vionuni polites exo apafiti dinethusa. Μιλάμε για τον απόλυτο έλεγχο της διαδικτυακής επικοινωνίας από τα συμφέροντα. Δεν μιλάμε για απειλή, μιλάμε για κίνδυνο εξόντωσης της πολυφωνίας των μέσων ενημέρωσης, της ελευθερίας πληροφόρησης και της ανθρώπινης αξιοπρέπειας. Πώς γίνεται ο έλεγχος της διαδικτυακής επικοινωνίας. Για τη δουλειά αρκούν ένα, τα κανάλια κράχτες που φτιάχνουν κλίμα στην κοινή γνώμη της χώρας Χ, με πρώτη ύλη την παρά και την αποπληροφόρηση. Δύο οι ελεγχόμενες δίθεν ενημερωτικές ιστοσελίδες που την αναπαράγουν και ο μισθοφορικός στρατός των τρόλς, τα οποία κυρίως μέσω του Twitter τη διαχέουν ανώνυμα σε όλο το διαδίκτυο. Το δημόσιο χρήμα διανέμεται αφιδός ως λάφυρο στους έμπιστους της κυβέρνησης Χ. Όλα στην υπηρεσία αλλαγή συμπεριφορά των πολιτών. Καθώ αρκεί μια κρίσιμη μειοψηφία στι αμφίρωπε εκλογικέ περιφέρειες, είτε να μεταστραφεί, είτε να μην πάει να ψηφίσει, επιλέγοντα την αποχή για να διαμορφωθεί ανάλογα το τελικό εκλογικό αποτέλεσμα σε κάθε χώρα. Ο αρχισυντάκτη τη κυβέρνηση Χ, τη χώρα Χ, στοχοποιεί του ζωηρού αντιπάλου τη αντιπολίτευση Χ, δολοφονεί χαρακτήρε, απομονώνει φράσει, αλλοιώνει έννοιε, διασπείρει ψεύδι και συκοφαντίε στο διαδίκτυο. Οι επιτελεί τη κυβέρνηση τη χώρα Χ ομαδοποιούν του πολίτε, επιχειρούν να 
πολιτοποιήσουν την κρίση τους. Στοχεύουν σε πολίτες πελάτες στα social media και στέλνουν τα κατάλληλα για την εκλογική τους συμπεριφορά μηνύματα. Ό,τι πιάνει στον καθένα. Ψυχολογικές, πολεμικές επιχειρήσεις για να εξαφανιστεί ο εχθρός της αντιπολίτευσης με τις δημοσκοπήσεις που δίνουν τεράστιες διαφορές υπέρ της κυβέρνησης, καθιστώντας την απογοήτευση, την παρέτηση, την ιδιώτευση των πολιτών εύλογη αντίδραση. Τι είναι όλο αυτό που περιέγραψα. Αυτή είναι η προπαγάδα του Project Alamo. Αυτή είναι η προπαγάδα του επιτελείου του Donald Trump. Είναι οι εθνικιστικές ακροδεξιές οι αρχές του Brexit. Είναι το σκάνδαλο Cambridge Analytica που έχουν δώσει κλόνους σε όλες τις ευρωπαϊκές χώρες μαζί με το αποκρουστικό αντιδημοκρατικό μήνυμα. Όλη η πολιτική είναι το ίδιο. Έτσι μερικοί από τους πολίτες που δεινοπαθούν από την πανδημία την ακρίβεια, την ανεργία, τη φτώχεια, την ανέχεια και τις επισφαλείς σχέσεις εργασίας οδεύουν στην αγκαλιά της ακροδεξιάς ή την ενίσχυσή της για τις αποχείς. Ποια είναι η χώρα Χ, πόσες και ποιες ευρωπαϊκές χώρες Χ βιώνουν το προαναφερόμενο πλαίσιο. Η ανωνυμία λειτουργεί ως όχημα για τη διάδοση ψευδών ειδήσεων, καθώς και για τη διάβραξη δολοφονιών με συμβόλαια θανάτου, τρομοκρατικών ενεργειών, εκβιασμών, απρόκλητων επιθέσεων κατά της ιδιωτικής ζωής. Όπως, και με αυτό κλείνω, η δολοφονία του δημοσιογράφου Γιώργου Καραϊβάζ στη χώρα μου. Δυστυχώ, ένα χρόνο και πλέον μετά η υπόθεση αυτή παραμένει ανεξυχνίαστη, εγείροντας σημαντικά ερωτήματα. Τι προτείνουμε ως Γουέλ. Κοινωνικό έλεγχο από όλους για όλους. Κοινωνική λογοδοσία όσων ασκούν κάθε μορφή εξουσία. Διαφάνεια παντού, στα πάντα, για τους πάντες. Σας ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστώ κύριε Πρόεδρε. Όποιος ελεύθερα συλλογάται, συλλογάται καλά. Στη φράση αυτή, η οποία ανήκει σε ένα από τους πρώτους οραματιστές της Ελεύθερης Ενωμένης Δημοκρατικής Ευρώπης των Λαών, του Ρίγα Φερέου Βελεστινλή, ενό δασκάλου από την Ελλάδα, συμπυκνώνεται το νόημα της ανθρώπινης αξίας. Απαραίτητο συστατικό επομένω της ανθρώπινης ελευθερίας είναι η ελευθερία στη σκέψη, η οποία δίδει νόημα στη ζωή του ανθρώπου, στην ύπαρξη και στη δράση του. Οραματιζόμαστε μια κοινωνία ελεύθερων ανθρώπων. Αυτή μπορεί να επιτευχθεί μόνο μέσα από τη γνώση. Αλλά η γνώση δεν έρχεται μαζί με τον άνθρωπο κατά τη γέννηση του στον κόσμο. Αποκτάται μέσα από την παρατήρηση και την πληροφόρηση. Χωρίς πληροφόρηση δεν υπάρχει γνώση. Και χωρίς γνώση δεν μπορεί να υπάρξει λόγος ούτε ασφαλώς έκφραση. Δεν είναι τυχαίο το γεγονό ότι τα πολυταρχικά και ανελεύθερα καθεστώτα πολεμούν διαχρονικά ως πρώτο εχθρό του στη γνώση. Το κάψιμο των βιβλίων παλαιότερα, ο αποκλεισμό από την πληροφορία αργότερα, η χειραγώγηση της γνώσης σήμερα, όλα τείνουν στη χειραγώγηση του ίδιου του πολίτη και τη μετατροπή του από ελεύθερο άνθρωπο σε υποζύγιο. Επομένως, η διαδικτυακή επικοινωνία και η πρόσβαση στην έγκυρη και υπεύθυνη πληροφόρηση αποτελεί σήμερα όχι μόνο αδύρητη ανάγκη, αλλά και αίτημα. Η εξάπλωση των ψηφιακών τεχνολογιών έχει ενισχύσει την πρόσβαση στη γνώση και μέσω αυτή στη διαμόρφωση τη γνώμη. Αυτό που επιβάλλει η Δημοκρατική Αρχή είναι η ελευθερία στην έκφραση και στο λόγο. Ταυτόχρονα όμω έχουν πολλαπλασιαστεί οι καταχρήσει και κίνδυνοι που συνδέονται με την ανεξέλεκτη χρήση των πλατφόρμων παροχή υπηρεσιών διαδικτύου που κατέχουν δεσπόζουσα θέση. Αυτέ οι εταιρείε έχουν καταστεί παντοδύναμε, ελέγχοντα τόσο την πρόσβαση των χρηστών στην πληροφόρηση, όσο και στο περιεχόμενο. Περαιτέρω αποκτούν σημαντικό εταιρικό πλεονέκτημα και την δυνατότητα φύλαξη τη εμπορική εκμετάλλευση των προσωπικών δεδομένων των χρηστών και άλλων ευαίσθητων στοιχείων. Η συσσόρευση τη ισχύω αυτή τη καθιστά πανίσχυρε και ικανέ να διαμορφώσουν την κοινή γνώμη και να επηρεάσουν εκλογικέ διαδικασίε και ακόμα να αποσιωπούν γεγονότα και να αποκλείουν από τη γνώση τη αλήθεια. Είναι κρίσιμο λοιπόν να εισαχθούν φραγμοί στην παντοδυναμία των παρόχων και να προστατευτεί η ιδιωτικότητα των χρηστών. Παρομοίως, η χρήση και αξιοποίηση της τεχνητής νοημοσύνης θα πρέπει να εγγυάται τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα και το κράτος δικαίου και όχι να οδηγεί στην άγνοια. Η θέσπιση του απαραίτητου νομοθετικού και θεσμικού πλαισίου είναι συνεπώς αναγκαία. Ορθώς η έκθεση 
προτείνει ότι οι νομοθέτε θα πρέπει να μεριμνούσαν να υπάρχει ισορροπία ανάμεσα στην ελευθερία του λόγου, την προστασία τη ιδιωτική ζωή και των προσωπικών δεδομένων, την εδραίωση του υγιού ανταγωνισμού και την πρόσβαση στη γνώση. Είναι πολύ ευχάριστο το γεγονό ότι η έκθεση και το ψήφισμα έχουν εμπλουτιστεί με τι τροπολογίε που αφορούν τα Wikileaks και την προσφορά του στην πληροφόρηση. Έχοντα υπόψη την αδυναμία, την απροθυμία στη διάχυση τη γνώση, ιδίω σε θέματα που αφορούν πολιτικά ζητήματα ή εθνικά συμφέροντα. Τεγιώνω με τη σπουδαία ρίση των εμπνευστών τη Γαλλική Επανάσταση και τη Οικουμενική Διακήρυξη Ανθρωπίνων Δικαιωμάτων. Λιγνοράνς, λουμπλίου λε με πρι, δε τρουατελόμ, σον λε σελ κο, τε μαλέρ πιπλίκ, ε τε λα κορουψιόν, δε κουβέρνεμον. Καταληκτικά, επομένω, οφείλουμε επομένως, να καταπολεμήσουμε τη διαφθορά και τα κακά του κόσμου αυτού, καταπολεμώντα την άγνοια από την ελευθερία τη γνώση, μέσω τη ελευθερία τη γνώση και τη πληροφόρηση. Thank you, sir. Uh, I underline that uh, I urge you to, to take care of the limit of three minutes, uh, or else you take the speaking time from other colleagues. Uh, and the limit, uh, the three minutes is the limit of uh, the speaking time. Then we continue uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the, the debate, and I call Mr. Gianni Marilotti from the Socialist uh, and Italy. The floor is yours. Grazie, signora Presidente, gentili colleghi. Questa Assemblea, proprio un anno fa, con l'adozione di un rapporto curato dal collega Rampi e approvato a stragrande maggioranza, ha riconosciuto il diritto alla conoscenza. Diritto che si intreccia con la libertà di stampa, sia online che offline, e con la cultura democratica che noi tutti, membri di questa Assemblea, abbiamo a cuore. Il diritto alla conoscenza riguarda il futuro di tutti noi, è in gioco il corretto funzionamento delle istituzioni democratiche e tutto questo è stato in qualche modo già sintetizzato non solo nel rapporto già menzionato ma in quella della Commissione Schilcott del 2016, una commissione d'inchiesta creata su impulso del Governo del Regno Unito nel 2009 a seguito dello scellerato attacco militare all'Iraq nel 2003. L'inchiesta Schilcott ha svolto i suoi lavori in sei anni, coinvolgendo cinque commissari, circa 180 testimoni, visionando oltre 150.000 documenti. Nella relazione finale si afferma che l'intervento in Iraq è stato affrettato, sanguinoso, destabilizzante e che era possibile considerare altre opzioni pacifiche prima di scatenare la guerra che era possibile contenere Saddam Hussein. Nel 2003 non esistevano minacce imminenti da parte del dittatore iracheno. Secondo il rapporto, le circostanze nelle quali il governo Blair stabilì l'esistenza di, di un fondamento legale per un intervento militare sono tutt'altro che soddisfacenti. Questo, cari colleghi, è l'amaro paradosso. Da un lato vi è chi, come Julian Assange, rischia l'ergastolo per aver fatto conoscere decisioni e fatti tragici. Dall'altro vi è chi non corre alcun rischio, nonostante abbia mentito, ingannato, distrutto, secondo la Commissione Schilcott, destabilizzato paesi e non ultimo il funzionamento stesso e il prestigio della democrazia parlamentare. Voglio qui ricordare la dichiarazione scritta del 31 gennaio del 2020, firmata da 37 colleghi dell'Assemblea parlamentare del Consiglio d'Europa sul caso Assange. Chiediamo alle istituzioni del Consiglio d'Europa e agli Stati membri di monitorare da vicino la questione, le questioni sollevate e di difendere i diritti di Julian Assange protetti dalla Convenzione europea dei diritti dell'uomo. Voglio concludere ricordando il monito di Eisenhower sul complesso militare industriale, perché è attuale e ci indica ancora oggi una strada per il futuro. Nel 1961 il Presidente affermò «Non dobbiamo dare nulla per scontato, solo una cittadinanza vigile e consapevole può contribuire all'integrazione dell'enorme complesso industriale militare con i nostri metodi e obiettivi pacifici, in modo che sicurezza e libertà possano prosperare insieme. Vi ringrazio.
Thank you, Mr. Marilotti. Mm -hmm. And then we continue to Mr. Kamal Yafarov from uh, Azerbaijan and the European Conservatives. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Madam President. How free we are in the social media when our preferences for like, share and comment are highly influenced by the predefined opinion of the majority or the strategically defined misinformation. If you make an analogy to the philosophy of the Immanuel Kant, freedom in social media is not a true freedom, simply because it involves satisfying desires we haven't chosen in the first place. When we like something, dislike something in social media, we are not really acting freely. We are acting as the slaves of the other's expectations. For example, there are situations where we don't like something, we don't share something, and because we think we will get bullied by some people we even don't know. The situation is worse in the case of children. They get bullied online, they do crazy stuff for views, and they repeat some trends in TikTok. Whenever our behavior is socially conditioned, it's not truly free. And if there is no democracy without the real possibility of making conscious, rational choices, then are we freely, really making free in our choices in social media? And this was the first part of the problem. And second part of the problem is that this kind of information flow concentration are in the hands of, hands of the few private organizations, which gives them huge economic and technological power, as well as the possibility to influence almost every aspect of the people's private and social lives. This raises a very important question on the capacity and willingness of these few corporate organizations for ensuring diversity of the information sources and pluralism of the ideas and opinions online. Other risk factors in this context are the lack of transparency of new forms of online advertising, which can too easily escape the restrictions applicable to advertising on traditional media, such as those intended to protect children, public morals, and social values. Even the traditional gatekeepers, like journalists, look forward to the news which will have the most clicks, rather than the, the value of the news. Then use of artificial intelligence and automated filters for content moderation is neither reliable nor effective. It's important to acknowledge and properly articulate the role and the necessary presence of the human decision makers, as well as the participation of the users in the establishment assessment of the moderation policies. I think that this report is in the right direction with some proposals. We need to adopt as a parliamentary and adequate institutional and legislative mechanism in order to navigate the path towards safe environment in social media. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yafaro. Uh, then I call uh, on behalf of uh, no, Alder Group and Fiona, Mrs. Fiona Loughlin, Loughlin uh, Ireland. No, I do not see her in the plenary. And then I call Mr. Koloman Brenner from Hungary. Neither he. And then we continue to uh, Spain and Seo Martinez, uh, Luz, uh, Seo Martinez from the Socialist Group. The floor is yours, Mrs. Gracias, señora presidenta. No hay duda de que hoy en día existe múltiple y muy diversa información. Me atrevo a decir que es casi un privilegio la facilidad de acceso a la información que tienen las sociedades modernas. Defiendo firmemente el pluralismo de ideas y de opiniones e Internet es el medio de información más extendido. Ciertamente esta es la riqueza de la comunicación en línea. Sin embargo, existe un gran riesgo, la creciente cantidad de información nociva que se halla en Internet. Este hecho es muy peligroso para niños, jóvenes y población vulnerable, que probablemente no contrastan la información que reciben con otras fuentes. Por tanto, son objetivos fácilmente manipulables e influenciables. Ni verificación de hechos, ni verificación de fuentes, solo una fuerte creencia en lo que dice Internet. Y esto no es bueno para la democracia, no es bueno para crecer como sociedades sanas y seguras. Y el gran peligro es que, como consecuencia, también crece el populismo. Hay que tener en cuenta que esto tiene un impacto enorme. No hay filtro suficiente en las redes sociales, no hay filtro para detener fake news, noticias falsas, información dañina. 
Es realmente preocupante comprobar que los niños o los adolescentes pueden tener tan fácil acceso a la pornografía o a la información dishonesta. El uso de discursos de odio o vocabulario agresivo incrementa las actitudes violentas. La pornografía fomenta comportamientos sexuales inaceptables y esto es lo contrario a la educación que deberíamos generalizar en Europa. Ciertamente este debate provoca dudas. ¿Debe prevalecer la libertad de expresión? ¿Cómo debe la legislación de los Estados miembros proteger a los niños, adolescentes y población vulnerable de estas prácticas? Sinceramente, creo que debe haber un límite. Desearía que todos los proveedores de Internet compartiesen un mínimo de principios éticos y los cumpliesen. Pero no podemos ser tan ingenuos como para pensar que estas empresas puedan manejarlo. Estos principios éticos en su actividad diaria deben ser garantizados. Hay una línea muy fina que marca las diferencias entre contenidos ilegales y contenidos dañinos. Tenemos legislaciones diferentes en los países europeos, pero ¿hasta dónde debemos llegar? Por ejemplo, en España hemos aprobado una ley para proteger a los niños y a los jóvenes ante cualquier tipo de violencia. Hemos establecido diferentes objetivos, cooperación para clasificar contenidos según edades, apoyo a los padres para seleccionar y evaluar contenidos, medidas de control parental proporcionadas por el Gobierno y el uso de herramientas de control parental proporcionadas por la industria intermediaria. Es decir, protección y un verdadero apoyo para decidir qué es perjudicial, especialmente para los niños. Debemos asegurarnos de que exista una ética en Internet para que todos conozcan los límites y respeten los límites. Soy consciente de que es difícil encontrar un equilibrio, pero el equilibrio es siempre la clave del éxito en política, alcanzar un consenso. Y esto es lo que deberíamos lograr en este informe. Muchas gracias. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Martinez Sayo. Then I call uh, Mr. Thorin Titus uh, Munkasi Iu uh, from Romania and the European uh, Conservatives. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, um, I'm about to give you a uh, certain feeling about what's happening when the manipulation and uh, these decisions do not belong to the real people, the people who should make the, those decisions. Uh, on the 10th of January 2020, a cartel of uh, media took upon themselves a decision to push and to get the pro-vaccination narrative because they thought this is the only way we can get through this pandemic situation. Now, what was the precaution? the repercussion for this uh, uh, <clears throat> thinking. It was the fact that the other narratives, which means the regular uh, medicine of the 21st century, was turned, we turned back to them. So this problem, to have a cartel of media decided which way to go in a pandemic situation, is very dangerous. And what happened was not only this cartel took over all the information in the Western Hemisphere, but on top of that, the social media was influenced. And uh, of course, this uh, new means like um, artificial intelligence took over and it happened that the medication and the protocols were ignored. The practice of medicine, the informal concern was ignored. Therefore, this pro-vaccination narrative was all over and was in the detriment of the other means of treatment. Moreover, it interfered with the consent because <clears throat> the adverse reactions were suppressed also. So this is a practical example when a cartel of media decided one narrative and that narrative is pushed to the public, the other ones are gonna suffer 
and sometimes the truth with it. Thank you, madam. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Munkasio. Uh, and then I continue to Alda and Madame Liliana Tanguy, uh, France. I did not, do not see her in the plenary, and I continue and give the floor to Mr. Kamil Aida, uh, Turkey. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair, dear colleagues. I would like to thank the rapporteur for his report. As we all are aware of freedom of, freedom of expression is one of the essential foundations of a democratic society. The online communication we are discussing today has revealed new opportunities to express ideas and to connect people with each other. These opportunities provide us with new ways to enjoy freedom of expression. Social media and the internet also have the potential to promote human rights and help young people get acquainted with our core values more closely. While social media offers unprecedented opportunities for the realization of human rights, it also has opened new possibilities for the surve surveillance of people on the basis of what they read, discuss, with whom they discuss it, whom they interact, what videos they watch, or what they upload. This surveillance does not necessarily have to be carried out only by the government. The internet intermediaries have also the necessary equipment to track people's internet activities. The internet and social media, which are controlled by internet intermediaries, have great power over individuals. Internet intermediaries have the power not only to induce people about their decisions to what, to where, to drink, or buy, it also has the power to manipulate the elections, spread disinformation, and prevent people from enjoying their freedom of expression. However, intermediaries should respect the human rights of their users and affected parties in all directions. Consequently, I would like to remind you that the, the member states have a positive obligation to protect human rights and to create a safe and enabling environment for everyone to participate in public debate and to express opinions and ideas without fear. Thus, member states should take all reasonable and appropriate regulations to ensure people enjoy their rights also in the digital area. However, Member states should also refrain from violating the right to freedom of expression and other human rights in the digital environment while preparing these regulations. And finally, I would like to emphasize that, you know, our committee member, Mr. Rice, is, as far as I heard from him today, he is going to be the, uh, he is going to be the uh, rapporteur of the last report and said that I would like to wish him a very happy and healthy life for the, for the rest of his life. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so uh, much, uh, Mr. Aydin. And then we continue to Alba Albania and uh, Mrs. Etilda Yonai. Socialist, no, is, she's not in the plenary. And I continue to Mrs. Anna Roberts from Canada and observ observer, observation. Madam President, fellow parliamentarians, and esteemed colleagues. First, I'd like to thank the committee and its repertoires for bringing this important issue to the assembly today. We live in a seemingly ever more digital world as increasingly aspects of our lives require some form of digital interaction, old distinctions between communication that happens online versus in real life have become antiquated. And as the committee report, as the committee's reported rightly points out, for the most part, the intermediates for those digital interactions are small groups of large multi national corporations, or as Canada's Competition Commission calls them, global digital giants. With the rise of these global digital giants, we have come, we, pardon me, have, have come growing concerns about the economic, political, and social power that they wield. 
Whatever you may think of the specific case, when a digital platform has the power to limit the speech of the President of the United States, arguably the most powerful person in the world, the influence of these platforms cannot be denied. Competition or antitrust laws have been put forward as one tool to address these concerns. Where global digital giants abuse their domain position, the dominant position in digital markets, or engage in merger, mergers and acquisition that hinder competition, competition regulators seem well placed to act under existing framework. Canada's Competition Commissioner, for one, has stated that the safeguarding competition in an era of global digital giants is paramount and competition regulators must prevent digital giants from becoming anti-competitive gatekeepers, deciding who gets to compete and potentially forcing new and innovative firms out of the market. But our competition laws, which are designed for an industrial brick and mortar economy capable of addressing the issues facing digital markets. For example, can competition laws respond to issues raised by the use of artificial intelligence or advanced uh, algorithms? How should competition laws operate in markets where competition is based on the collection of data instead of price? Debates on the needs for reform often boil down to the problems that competition regulators are expected to address. In Canada, at least competition laws have traditionally forced focused on economic issues, promoting economic efficiency through competitive markets. The law was never intended to deal with issues related to free speech, privacy, or the environment. The question therefore becomes whether competition laws should evolve to address the various issues raised by the concerns, concentration of power in digital markets, or do a range of issues require a range of responses. Answering these questions will be critical to determining the best approach to dealing with concerns related to the global digital giants and discussions and the sharing of best practices through forums such as PATHS offer an invaluable opportunity to consider different perspectives and approaches to the common challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Roberts. And then we continue to Finland and Mrs. Inka Hopsu, uh, Socialist Group. No? Sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, is it possible that I take over my colleague's uh, speech of Mr. Howell, John Howell, or is that not possible in the procedure? Why does he it, come in at the end just as yeah, easy? Yeah, you can come at the end then, I think. You can continue, and if you want to take the f uh, floor later, I give it to you. But uh, then, um, Mrs. Inka... No, I don't know. If, uh, I can wait if, if you... Yeah, it's okay. I don't know what is the... Method it's not, it's not a normal uh, way to do it, okay. so we continue on the list. But Thank I you remember you, sir. Yeah. I understand. Thank yeah. you. Uh, but uh, in Ms. Mrs. Inka Hopsu is not uh, here. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, she's used, you there. Yes, please. Madam Good President, yours. dear colleagues, uh, thank you for the reporter for raising this not so easy matter, the need for social media regulations. Online communication has become an essential part of our everyday lives. Its influence on people's opinions, actions and behaviour is huge. That's why we must follow, regulate and improve the pluralism of who is controlling the information, who is making the actual choices on what kind of information people see and who owns the information collected on us and what it is used for. It is partly problematic that online platforms are giant entities trying to make profit, yet, as experience has shown, their activities have a huge impact on human rights, especially on the right to privacy and freedom of speech. Hate speech and freedom of speech are not always clear, and unfortunately, many want to blur them. Hate speech is often directed towards politicians and authorities. In Finland, the Prosecutor General has been uh, determined in prosecuting cases of hate speech, defama defamation, persecution and ethnic agitation. As a result, she has been targeted by trolls in social media. 
The same trolls attacked her online when she reported the Finnish National Prosecution Authority's intention to participate in the investigation of war crimes in Ukraine. Many of those spreading hate online reject criticism by saying that soon we can't say anything more. However, we must see the connection between hate speech and human rights violations. Often in history, hate speech has become the path to violence. Inciting hatred lays the ground for graver actions. The consequences of dehumanization have been seen in Rwanda, Yugoslavia and now in Ukraine. Social media has enabled the anonymous and faster than previous spread of such messages. We legislators must stay on top of it. Our regulations and oversight must follow suit so that we can quickly stop such criminal and harmful contact and action. The responsibility lies both with the platforms and their users. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sapsu. And then we continue to uh, Slovak Republic and Alda and Mr. Miroslav Siak. The floor is yours. Sir. Thank you, madam. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest export article of Russia is propaganda and fake news. They spend uh, such amount of money and we are facing a dangerous threat. In Slovakia live so many people who believe in this fake news. For imagine, nearly 50% of teachers are believe in fake news. It was found by survey. Therefore, I welcome and support the report with a resolution. But I still think we will have to do much more. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Siak. And uh, then I call uh, Mrs. Sienep Yildiz from Turkey. Thank yes. you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, uh, I would like to thank to, uh, Mr. Reyes for his excellent report, which identifies current and new questions and problems in rapidly digitalizing world and offers concrete solution for these questions and problems. Uh, while the means of communication facilitated and strengthened with this digitalization area, uh, era, uh, the mass media platforms has also transformed. The digital platforms actually became the new mass communication medium nearly for all. As the traces left by individuals, as the personal data turns into an economic value, the need of having legislative measures becomes more crucial. Along with its economic dimension, the new era of digitalization has brought us the necessity of having a legal framework that protects the basic human rights also in the digital platforms. Unlike the uh, other economic-based social transformations, that uh, world has undergone throughout history, it's very clear that legal measures regarding digitalization should be taken on a, a global scale. As the current globalization of this new data-based economical structure embraced people on the global level more than ever. Throughout history, economies have been strengthened by people's consuming products. Today, it has evolved into an economic order in which people's preferences are, are product productized through algorithms. In this respect, I would like to express that I find it val very valuable that the uh, concept of human dignity is placed at the heart of this report. Dear colleagues, we have to know that to make a strong emphasis on uh, the need of pluralism on the digital platforms is not uh, only important for, uh, just for having antitrust legislation in the market, but for protecting the right of expression of individual, indiv individuals as well. To make an emphasis uh, on the protection of personal data is not only important for preventing people from feeling themselves alone in a public sphere, but also uh, for protecting people's privacy and dignity. And, all, and to fight against this information and the digital harassment is not only for maintaining the public order in the digital platforms, but also to protect people's freedom of obtainment of information and freedom of communication. Hopefully, the report covers these points as a whole and serves solutions for these current problems. By bearing in mind these points, Member States and the Assembly should ensure all people in Europe and all around the world enjoy their freedom of expression and protect their dignity and privacy in the digital environment. 
In order to do so, as these platforms having service globally, there must be social media and internet regulations, not only continent, on the continental level, but also on the global level, uh, which protect people's fundamental rights. And uh, this assembly may take an initiative in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Yildiz. And then I call uh, Mr. Evan Eriksson, Socialist uh, and Norway. The floor is yours, Mr. Eriksson. Madam President, first I would like to thank the reporter for a job well done. The control of online communication is a very relevant topic in our modern society. Every day, many Europeans live their lives on their devices for hours. It's crucial that social media balance uh, the user's freedom of speech and their need of protection against fake news and hate speech. This is one of the many issues at hand in this debate and the one that I would like to address. When you read something on Facebook, how can you know it is true? How can you know that the information uh, has not been paid for by someone that wants to influence you with something? Maybe it's not information after all, but disinformation or conspiracy theories. Madam President, the amount of disinformation available online is at a growing rate. For instance, during the war in Ukraine, we have been subject to a lot of Russian disinformation. Fake videos, false reports and propaganda. This is very serious. We also have evidence uh, of multiple examples of third-party entities trying to influence elections through social media. That is a serious threat to our democracy. Internet is a scary place to be, Madam President, but it is also a place to connect and reconnect with family and friends and to express views and feelings on community matters. Social media has revolutionized our ways to communicate how we communicate with each other and how we can gain information. This development uh, forces us to adapt our legislation in order to face the threats and opportunities that arise. The platforms have the responsibility to ensure the protection of users' rights, privacy and dignity. There is a fine balance between uh, lack of control and restriction of the freedom of speech. As the Norwegian Minister of Culture and Gender Equality said in our parliament earlier this year, uncontrolled distribution of illegal content is obviously damaging to public discourse. But we do not want a situation where the platforms, on their own initiative, moderate and remove so much legal content that it goes beyond the freedom of speech. I agree with her. Madam President, I call on the Council of Europe to, um, and the Member States to ensure this legislation take this fine balance into account. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Eriksson. And then I give the floor to Mrs. Uh, Eva Sivini uh, Fatalieva from uh, European Conservatives and Azerbaijan. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much to the reporter, first of all, for his uh, important report, which raises important questions for us. Uh, the development of telecommunication technologies and digital media have greatly changed our life, especially in recent years during the pandemic. People have begun to spend most of their time online, socializing, communicating with each other, spending free time. All over the world, people are already accustomed to work and get education distantly. From one side, the addiction of children as well as their parents on mobile devices, social networks, internet media is growing. From another, the rapid development of telecommunication and media technologies has changed the very nature of the media. They have become an integral part of our life, reflecting everything that happens. Today, we can watch in real time not only sport concerts, performances. All events taking place in any corner of the world can be broadcasted, live on social networks without specifying the backgrounds, the reasons, context and condition of the event. Thus manipulating the people's mind, creating desired opinions and views in society. Also, the race for high audience ratings is also reflected in current affairs news report. 
the news that the media present to the audience is often tried, bizarre, scandalous. Uh, media and social networks alongside with being a tool of propaganda of different values, notions, facts and developments, forming sometimes false opinion of people, are used not only as a tool for delivering and receiving information, but also they turn information into one of the most valuable types of capital and the resource of the great income. Those who possess this capital along with the, uh, the associated infrastructure Structure have enormous economic power that can be used in different purposes. Ladies and gentlemen, we all agree that the lack of information causes lack of participation of people within society. And today we are facing a great challenge and responsibility. It is not in power of humans to resist the spread of media communication and digitalization of information. But I'm sure that we can regulate the social media and communication, prioritizing democracy and protecting human rights and dignity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fatalieva. And then I call uh, Madame Nicole Tris, France, and uh, the Alde Group. She's not in plenary. Then we continue to Mr. Martin Beluski, Slovak Republic. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Madame, Madame Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, this report deals with the control of online communication with intent to make state members use antitrust legislation and to ensure that mere automated content moderation is not allowed by the legislation. But I would like to draw your attention to another very important topic regarding media control. As it is written in the draft resolution, whoever controls online communication during the, for example, election campaigns may become a formidable political force. Voters may be seriously encumbered in their decision by misleading, manipulative, or false information. Whilst increased democratic oversight is necessary, regulation enacted in practice often entails overbroad power and the discretion of government authorities over information flows, which endanger freedom of expression. If we allow governments to freely control the media, they can and some will abuse their right to intervene in people's right to get information. As witnessed in Slovakia, our government adopted the law where one government office has right to block a whole website simply by saying it was promoting severe disinformation. But without any definition, without right to correct direction, we can say without fear the government found a tool how to silence uncomfortable opinions without public control. Yes, as the report says, internet intermediaries should be particularly mindful of their duty of care where they produce or manage the content available of their platforms or where they play a curatorial or editorial role while avoiding, avoiding taking down third-party content except for clearly illegal content. But the same should be used for governments. They shouldn't use tools to take down any website content except for, of course, for illegal content. However, this information is not illegal and it shouldn't be pretext for taking down the whole website. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Belutsky. And then I give the floor to Mr. Jeremy Corbyn, United Kingdom and the Socialist. Thank you, Madam Vice President. It's a pleasure to be able to speak in this and I thank the rapporteur for the debate, which has ensured we can have a serious discussion about the power of social media. Social media and platforms are a massive ability around the world for people to communicate with each other. But they're also powerful and they're also controlled by very powerful people. And so the illusion that we often have of the freedom to communicate on social media platforms is one that is actually, as many speakers have indicated, under control of somebody else. I think to the bravery of the farmers in India when they were mounting huge protests, against the marketization of their farms in India, all their internet access, all their platforms were closed down at the whim of the government of India in cooperation with those that own and run those media platforms. An illusion that was there that somehow or other they were free to communicate with each other. And this happens time and time again around the world when people want their voice to be heard and it's uncomfortable for the government concerned, the owners of these platforms cooperate with that government and close them down and silence those voices. The algorithms that um, operate on how we individually use social media give us the illusion 
of choice, the illusion of searching for information in a free and open way, but in reality, those algorithms drive us immediately to one source of information or another, one point of view or another, and this has a massive effect on elections all over the world, where elections are manipulated by algorithms and by social media giants that control them. Again, people thinking they have the freedom of choice, in reality they're being directed in a certain way. It is political control that is exercised through very high technology. The report draws attention to the uh, platforms that are under threat, but doesn't say too much about the danger to journalists. And I just think we should pause for one second and think of the murder of Shireen Abu Akleh, for example, for speaking out on behalf of Palestinian people on Al Jazeera. And there are many other journalists under threat. There is an amendment down, which I strongly recommend we support by Giovanni uh, Mercelli and others, uh, concerning WikiLeaks and the situation in which Julian Assange finds himself at the present time. Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, told a lot of very uncomfortable truths around the world. Uncomfortable truths about American power, about the CIA, about Guantanamo Bay, about Iraq, about Afghanistan, and about many other issues around the world. In some ways, he'd be called a hero. Instead, he's in a maximum security Britain, a prison in Britain and about to be deported to the United States to get a sentence of over 170 years. This is an outrage beyond belief that somebody who spoke up for the truth, for peace, for justice and for safety, is threatened with three life imprisonments. Surely, if we're talking about media freedoms, we also talk about respecting and defending journalists who've used that freedom to inform all of us. Thank you, Mr. Corbyn, and then uh, give the floor to Mrs. Tara, Tar, Tarja Filato, uh, Finland and Socialist. Floor is yours. President, dear colleagues, online communication has become a part of our daily lives. We are talking about an infrastructure that has evolved into a necessity for better and for worse. Our daily lives have moved to the digital environment much faster than the values, structures and modes of operation that uphold our democratic societies. We spend our time online, we interact with others, we search for information, we work and entertain ourselves. The internet remembers what we have already forgotten. The algorithms connect the dots and draw up accurate profiles of us offering commercials, materials and services in accordance with our profiles, or they don't offer. However, the internet must not become a parallel reality where people are not affected by the laws of real life. Right and wrong are the same both in real life and online. We need pluralistic free internet, yet one's freedom must not violate other people's rights. Everyone's online action, people have become a resource of the data economy. Many rightly ask who owns my information and what it is used for. Digitalization and the data economy enable welfare and a rapid growth in productivity. At the same time, we must recognize the unfairness of data-based economy, as power is concentrated to a few data giants. Concentration distorts competition. The lack of rules for data economy can hurt people, businesses and societies. Popular social media platforms and digital trade centers are part of society's critical infrastructure. Platforms and their algorithms have too much power in deciding what information is offered to whom. Such power can be abused to manipulate people. While market manipulation is forbidden, one might ask why such manipulation of people is allowed online. Fake news, hate speech, sexual harassment and other drawbacks of the internet are difficult to control but it, not, it does not justify giving up on tackling these harmful problems. In a worst case scenario, non-regulation might erode democracy. We must increase our understanding of the digital work 
world information literacy must be improved. It is a new, from, a new form of basic reading and writing skills. This is important for everybody and this is important for our democracy. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Filato. And then I call uh, Mr. Armen Georgian, Armenia and European Conservatives. The floor is yours. Thank you. Madam Chair, the social networks and modern communication technologies have become main tools for ideological influence over the past decade. In a sense, we now live in an era where a new type of individual is being born. Someone who has ceased belonging to his own state, his community, or even to himself, but rather depending on social networks and the messages they broadcast. This over-dependence from social networks has been leading to disintegration of other fundamental democratic values and institutions, and top among those, the free and fair elections. It creates a certain erosion of freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Experts have shown that via social networks, certain groups can potentially manipulate the political preferences of about 25% of the electorate. Algorithms have already seized control of the emotions and wishes of millions of people worldwide, while entire states turn into digital colonies of their external administrators. In our times, when social networks have degraded true and facts to only secondary importance compared to feelings, when some politicians successfully practice post-through politics, we must acknowledge that democratic and republican form of governance is in deep crisis. The above mentioned processes now form a new format of communication between governments and the governed. And here, the democratic form of governance is not necessarily the unquestionable choice for ensuring sustainable developments of modern states. The government can no longer disagree, disregard the moods expressed in likes and dislikes in social networks. And some of them at the same time use the social networks in order to sway the public moods, steer division in the society and artificially dominate the public discourse especially in times of nationwide campaigns. Madam Chair, the Council of Europe and this assembly in particular must identify a reasonable balance and good merit of measuring the democratic credentials of European states. Namely, we shall work to develop a code of conduct for democratic states where governments in particular must be urged on ensure the right of the public to communicate freely online without interference. This includes not only adopting legal provisions to undermine organized networks, disseminating fake news and hate speech, but also proactively investing in improving media literacy among the public. Of course, it must be the role of this organization to find a reasonable balance and prevent this from becoming a punishment tool at the hands of the government against media and online activism, and indeed promote a free and pluralistic flow of information online, which is respectful of human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gevorgian. And then I give the floor till, uh, to uh, Mr. Hector James uh, Ramirez uh, Barba, Mexico. The floor is yours, Presidenta. Felicito, in primer lugar, al ponente, el señor Frederick Grace, al visibilizar de manera acertada los ataques de la libertad de expresión y el pluralismo en la, en la comunicación digital. Coincidimos plenamente con la resolución propuesta en el hemiciclo, pues afirma que la comunicación en las plataformas digitales debe ser abierta, transparente, plural y debe basarse en el libre acceso a la información de interés público, así como en la responsabilidad de quienes generan contenidos y los difunden. Es real la preocupación que la comunicación digital esté controlada o sea desvirtuada por un grupo de corporaciones o por instituciones del Estado, pues el riesgo es muy alto para las libertades, impactando la seguridad, la privacidad y el ejercicio de los derechos ciudadanos. Celebramos el pronunciamiento a favor de una legislación más estricta que proteja derechos de usuarios, evite la consolidación de grandes corporaciones privadas o públicas que distorsionen la información digital, proteja la pluralidad de fuentes disponibles en línea, la objetividad de la información y el Internet como plataforma de difusión de ideas en un marco de libertad de expresión. 
Además, que las instituciones públicas respeten los derechos de la población en el acceso a los medios digitales. El pasado 10 de marzo del presente año, los parlamentarios europeos se pronunciaron en contra de las violaciones a los derechos humanos de periodistas en mi país, México. La estrategia del gobierno y su partido político gobernante ha sido la utilización de plataformas digitales difundiendo mensajes de odio y noticias falsas para denigrar, desacreditar y amenazar a los periodistas, a la prensa y a quienes somos oposición. Una investigación del National Democratic Institute y del Stanford Internet Observatory evidenciaron que redes de cuentas de Twitter atacaban a periodistas y medios de comunicación que criticaban al presidente. El reporte global Freedom House México Informe de País 2020, Libertad de la Red, expone que preexiste la manipulación de contenido, amenazas y ataques cibernéticos coordinados contra periodistas y la prensa, alimentado en parte por la dura retórica del presidente López Obrador contra ellos, queriendo incluso él crear sus propias redes sociales para mantener el control del flujo de información con fines políticos. Por ello, estimadas señorías presentes aquí, los exhortamos para aprobar la resolución a fin de que los estados garanticen a sus ciudadanos el derecho de comunicarse libremente en las plataformas digitales en un marco de ley con respeto a los derechos humanos y a la pluralidad democrática. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez Barba. And then I call uh, Mr. Pedro Goncó uh, and uh, from Portugal and the Socialist Group. Sorry for the pronunciation. Thank you, Madam President, dear colleagues. This report covers a sensitive issue. The concentration of the Internet business in the hands of a few private corporations gives them huge economic and technological power, as well as the possibility to influence almost every aspect of people's life and social life. Afterwards, the use of artificial intelligence and automatic filters for content moderation is neither reliable nor effective. Is this very important that the Assembly could bring the, uh, the Member States legislation to observe the human rights impacts of algorithmic systems and on the roles and the responsibilities of Internet intermediaries at the concentration of economic and techno technological power in their hands with the correct competition regulations and tools. We underline the report aim to avoid pushing new actors outside the market or enabling them to enter the market. However, those, those measures must guarantee that any legislation imposing duties or restrictions on Internet with an impact on users' freedom of expression be exclusive, exclusively aimed uh, at dealing with illegal content to uh, avoid broader notions as harmful content. It is urgent to ensure that mere automated content moderation is not allowed by national legislation. In connection, we must encourage internet intermediaries via, via legal and policy measures to allow users to choose means of direct and e efficient communication uh, which do not solely rely on automatic tools. We salute the rapporteur when firmly urges to guarantee that legally mandated content moderation provides the necessary presence of human decision makers and incorporates sufficient safeguards so that freedom of expression is not hampered. Therefore, we must counteract hate speech online by issuing warming message to persons who spread hate speech online by inviting users to review message before sending them. Encourage internet intermediates to add such guidelines to the codes of conduct dealing with hate speech, as our colleagues has written at this report. We must be very concerned with the electoral codes. Let's consider adapting election legislation and policies tuned to the new digital environment by re reviewing provisions on electoral communication. In this aspect, reinforce accountability of Internet in terms of transparency and access to data. Therefore, we agree the approval of this important report and its resolutions. Thank you, Madam President. 
Thank you, sir uh, Gono. Uh, and even if there are few left on the list uh, included, Van Pareren, I have to close the list of speakers now. Uh, I must now interrupt the list of speakers, as I said, and the speeches of members uh, on the speakers' list who have been present during the debate but have not been able to speak may be given to the table office for publication in the official report. I remind colleagues that time-written texts must be submitted electronically, if possible, no later than four hours after the list of speakers is interrupted. I call Mr. Rice, Rapporteur, to reply to the debate. You have five minutes, sir. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Après ce débat de haut niveau, avec parfois des approches philosophiques, je voudrais remercier tous les intervenants qui euh, ont bien compris euh, la difficulté euh, des sujets, tant leurs propos ont été euh, pertinents, parfois passionnés. Le nombre d'inscrits, d'ailleurs, en fin de journée, prouve l'importance du sujet. Et il est évident qu'aujourd'hui, il y a une évidence qui, que ceux qui détiennent un maximum d'informations sur les populations de ce monde détiennent le pouvoir. Et ça, c'est très inquiétant. Beaucoup ont relevé euh, que les mécanismes de contrôle et les manipulations euh, sont présentes aujourd'hui et que le plus important est de garantir le pluralisme sur le net. On a beaucoup parlé d'intelligence artificielle, alors c'est une aide certaine, mais attention à ne pas aller trop loin. Il faut en effet éviter les monopoles, les monopoles des géants d'Internet, parce que nous avons tous besoin de plus d'informations et de mieux d'informations. Alors il est évident aussi qu'il faut aujourd'hui euh, permettre l'accès à la connaissance et j'ai aussi une pensée pour tous les journalistes assassinés, euh, certains d'entre vous y ont fait euh, référence. Albert Camus a dit « La liberté n'offre qu'une chance d'être meilleure, la servitude n'est que la certitude de devenir pire ». Il s'agit donc particulièrement d'en de, tenir compte euh, pour l'éducation et la protection de nos jeunes. Et je suis entièrement d'accord avec ceux et celles qui ont mis en avant les principes déontologiques qui doivent être présents régulièrement. Le défi qui est devant nous est effectivement immense. Et il existe un besoin évident d'un cadre éthique en plus du cadre juridique. Sans normes éthiques, les développements technologiques pourraient être utilisés contre toute moralité humaine. Tant d'un point de vue juridique qu'éthique, les plateformes des médias sociaux doivent assumer leurs responsabilités pour garantir un flux d'informations en ligne libre et pluraliste et respectueux des droits de l'homme. Alors effectivement, aujourd'hui, c'est mon dernier rapport, dans la mesure où après quatre mandats, j'ai décidé de laisser ma place à des plus jeunes que moi. Je voudrais remercier M. Aydin pour son mot sympathique. Je voudrais remercier aussi le secrétariat de la Commission, Roberto Fasino et Eugène Sibutaro, qui ont été une aide précieuse et j'ai d'ailleurs eu l'honneur de présider pendant quelques mois cette belle commission qui est aujourd'hui présidée par Lord Dundee. Ça a été un honneur pour moi de travailler dans cet hémicycle pendant toutes ces années pour défendre les droits de l'homme et pour véhiculer les valeurs du Conseil de l'Europe. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Does the chairperson of the committee wish to speak, Lord Dundee? You have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, dear colleagues, politics uh, is dependent on communication. Uh, and today, this is mainly, as we know, online. Moreover, democracy is dependent on free access to quality, reliable, unbiased information. Therefore, as has been frequently said today, we have to control the threat uh, from a number of internet participants who seek to undermine the flow uh, of information online. And as um, the report by Frederick 
Rice uh, correctly highlights, the key issue here is not the huge economic and technological power of some big operators, but the, simply the position they find themselves in to influence almost every aspect of people's private and social lives. A diversity of information sources, ideas and opinions must be preserved online. Equally, economic, technological and information power has to be held to account so that it becomes a democratic intervention rather than a one-sided political power. A range of PACE reports have already indicated how people's decisions can be altered by misleading, manipulative and false information and that algorithmic systems can be abused or used dishonestly uh, to shape the formation of individual and collective opinions and actions. Clearly, we need to guard against this. Today's resolution offers balanced proposals. These build on a key idea. Internet intermediaries need to allow a full and free flow of information online consistent with human rights, legal and ethical perspectives. And to make this happen, our national legislation and practices have to be in line with the recommendations used by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. In this field, our countries should also set up rules to advance transparency, justice, non-maleficence, responsibility, privacy, rights, and freedoms of users. Then on electoral communications, our internet operators must be held to account to enhance transparent access to data, quality journalism, as well as a critical evaluation of electoral communication and media literacy. I thank you very much for supporting the resolution. I hope it will be carried unanimously here, uh, then become adopted in our national parliaments so that these necessary safeguards uh, can come to apply in all our Council of Europe states. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lord Dundee. Uh, the debate is uh, closed. The Committee on Culture, Science and Education and Media has presented a draft resolution, document 15537, to which three amendments and three subamendments have been tabled. Amendments 2, 3 and 1 and their subamendments must, must be dealt with individually. Amendments will be taken in the order in which they appear in the comp compendium. And I remind you that speeches on amendments are limited to 30 seconds. Uh, we start with amendment 2 with sub-amendment, and um, I call Mr. Gianni Mar Marilotti to support amendment two. You have 30 seconds. He's not here. Yeah, you are. You Ma are questo emendamento, come dicevo nel mio intervento, eh, tende a um, sottolineare il paradosso per cui noi conosciamo una serie di storture portate avanti dal governo britannico, riconosciute da una commissione governativa, eh, e invece il paradosso che chi ha reso pubbliche prima che questa commissione procedesse rischia l'ergastolo. Grazie. Thank you. Uh, I call uh, Mr. Rice on behalf of the Committee on Culture, Science and Education and Media to support the sub-amendment. Oui, merci Madame la Présidente. Alors sur le fond uh, de cet amendement, nous sommes d'accord et je l'ai dit dans la, la discussion générale que l'objectif initial de Wikileaks est aller dans le sens d'information pluraliste et transparente et que les principes généraux, c'était la liberté d'expression et sa diffusion par les, les médias. Euh, C'est juste la place qui nous dérange et je propose donc dans le sous-amendement, au lieu de mettre après euh, le paragraphe 1, de placer cet amendement après le paragraphe 3, puisque dans le paragraphe 3, on, on parle du manque de transparence et des nouvelles formes de publicité en ligne. Thank you. Does anyone uh, wish to speak against the sub-amendment? None? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to speak against it because of the reference to Wikileaks. We all read it, of course, it's very interesting, but let us not forget that this is, was a leakage 
it was illegally obtained information and uh, it is not a correct uh, form of reference. And then despite don't disregard of the content, the legally obtained information should not be referred to. Thank you. Thank you. What is the opinion uh, of the mover of the main amendment? I call uh, Mr. Gianni Marilotti. What's the opinion? Sono con, sono d'accordo con il, su, il subemendamento. L'accetto. Mover of the main amendment is uh, supported, and uh, as the mover of the sub amendment, and the committee is clearly in favour. Yes. I shall now put the sub amendment to the vote, and the vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the result to be displayed. The subamendment is agreed to. Thank you. I will now uh, co consider the main amendment. Does anyone wish to speak against the amendment uh, as amended? No, none. Uh, what is the opinion of the, uh, of the Committee on Culture, Science, Education and Media on the amendment? In favour? The committee is in favour. And I sh shall now put amendment 2 to the vote and the vote is open. The vote is closed. I call, call for the result to be displayed. Amendment 2. We wait for the result. It's agreed to. And then Amendment 3 with sub-amendment. Uh, I call Mr. Gianni Marilotti to support Amendment 3. You have 30 seconds, sir. No, spendo questi 30 secondi per ringraziare il relatore eh, che ha fatto un eccellentissimo lavoro. Grazie. Thank you. I call Mr. Rice uh, on behalf of the committee um, to support the sub amendment. You also have 30 seconds. Oui, Madame la Présidente, parce que c'est pour la clarté un petit peu de, de l'écriture de ces ouvrages d'amendement. En, en réalité, on voudrait que l'amendement euh, 3 et l'amendement 1 ne fassent qu'un amendement. Et c'est pour ça qu'on rédige différemment euh, le début de, de l'amendement. Et en réalité, donc, les deux amendements euh, sont placés après euh, l'article, le par paragraphe 14 et commence donc par le droit à une information libre et pluraliste et renforcée par, etc. Et la, la dernière partie de l'amendement 1 disparaîtrait. Donc en fait, les deux amendements sont liés, et donc d'où ce sous-amendement. Thank you. Does anyone uh, wish to speak against the sub-amendment? The sub-amendment? No. None against. What is the opinion of the mover of the main amendment? I uh, call Mr. Gianni Marilotti. Sono favorevole. In favor. Uh, as the, uh, I shall now put the sub amendment uh, to the vote, and the vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the result to be displayed. The sub-amendment is agreed to. We will now consider the main amendment, the main amendment. Does anyone wish to speak against the amendment? No. Uh, what is the opinion of, of the committee on the, uh, the amendment as amended? In favor. I shall now put amendment three to the vote and the vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the result to be displayed.
And amendment three is agreed to. Then we continue to amendment one with sub-amendment. I call Mr. Gianni Marilotti to support amendment one, and you have 30 seconds, sir. Um, ma, insomma, abbiamo parlato abbastanza di questo argomento, eh, rinnovo i ringraziamenti al relatore, eh, vi prego di, di, di votare questo emendamento. Grazie. Thank you, it's always good with the thanks. So I call Mr. Rice on behalf of the committee uh, to support sub-amendment. Oui, merci Madame la Présidente. En fait, donc cet amendement fait que ce qui reste, c'est dans le cadre du traitement de l'information, les intermédiaires d'Internet sont tenus d'agir conformément aux principes énoncés dans la résolution 2382, la liberté des médias, la confiance du public et le droit de savoir des citoyens. Tout le reste disparaît puisque ça figure dans l'amendement 3 que nous venons d'adopter. Thank, thank you. Uh, does anyone wish to speak against the subamendment? No. What is the opinion of the mover of the main amendment? I call Mr. Gianni Marilotti. Favorevole. In favor. As the mover of the sub-amendment, the committee is clearly in favor. I shall now put the sub-amendment to the vote, and the vote is open. And the vote is closed. I call for the result to be displayed. And the sub-amendment is agreed to. We shall now consider the main amendment. The main amendment. Does anyone wish to speak against the amendment? No. What is the opinion of the committee on the amendment? In the committee is in favor. I shall now put amendment one to the vote, and the vote is open. And the vote is closed. I call for the result to be displayed. Amendment 1 is agreed to. Thank you. We will now proceed to vote on the draft resolution contained in document 15537, and the vote is open. And the vote is closed. I call for the result to be displayed. And the draft resolution in document 15537 is adopted. And this is Mr. Rice's last report. On behalf of colleagues, I would like to thank you uh, for your work as rapporteur for several reports, important reports, and also how you have uh, cooperated uh, in, in the plenary. And uh, we all wish you all the best in the, in the future, and we will miss you here, Mr. Mr. Rice. The Assembly, yeah. A good applause is always good to take with, with the back home. The Assembly will hold its, its next public sitting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with the agenda, which was approved on Monday morning, and the sitting is adjourned. Have a good evening, all of you.